to you. Uh, good morning to you, uh, delegates. If there are anybody that's in the morning session that want to load your presentations, please let's load the presentations now for the morning session. If you are in the same venue uh, for after tea, you'll see us during tea to load your presentations. And if you're after lunch, you see us during lunch. So anyone that's in the morning session, uh, now you can load your presentation if you're in the plenary. Uh, James, testing sound for James for the camera to see if the f mic is working fine there. Uh, James Gardner, anyone know James Gardner? Uh, oh, hey, oh, Toba, you. <laughs> uh, James, only one presentation came for the morning.
and I was wondering how best do I represent the Public Service Commission, a Chapter 10 institution, which, among other things, is entrusted with the promotion of constitutional values and principles in the public service. And doing so at the time when it is quite clear that the country has lost the moral compass, has no moral code, but only on paper. And I was tossing and I ended up even last night, Dumsani changing a little bit of the topic, reflection on the state capacity and government performance through the first 10 years of the NDP. Then I went on to say paradox and dilemma of good policies and poor application. The case of ethics, values, and principles and the new pathways. Most of us will have attended so many conferences because you know South African elite, us, we love conferences. We love workshops. We even change names of them we said it's a conference this time next year, we say it's a symposium, we say it's a webinar. When that runs out, we say Lichotla, we say Bosperat, we say Indaba DG, and uh, we just keep creating these. And I've started believing, as I said yesterday, that we might start confusing us talking about problems with solving problems. These are good networking sessions, but do they translate into changes? Have we ever quantified what each ticket that was purchased for me the car rented for me, the hotel I sleep in, the meals we're eating would have done for an ordinary person in an informal settlement. If we begin to analyze that opportunity cost, do we really care what was said? If we don't, we have become part of the unethical group of people. Ethics is not about violating supply chain. It is about when you stop caring and worrying about the condition of the next person because at a given time you are fine. That is the first unethical behavior. When you see somebody scavenging for food outside your yard in a dustbin, and you see somebody sleeping on a sidewalk and you are not disturbed by it, you are just fine because you can pay for your own bills and your kids are fine, you are okay. That's when you begin to see that your conscience is in a coma. I won't bore you with what PSC mandate is. I'll just go straight to the issues. Because in those constitutional values, section 195 of chapter 10 of the Constitution, 
do talk about a number of things, human dignity, equality, human rights, non-racialism, non-sexism, talk of transparency, inclusion, talks of high professional ethics, transparency, accountability, responsiveness, efficient and economical use of resources, and so forth. We are at a crossroads where the country is experiencing unprecedented crisis, whether it's social, political, economic, and public service is said to be the most important organs of our state which can assist in a big way to provide services. Maybe I should start by invoking Franz Fanon when he said in his book, The Wretched of the Earth, he opens one chapter by saying, every generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. In this era of ethical crisis, what is the mission of us today? Or is it business as usual? The journey starts in 1994. We have this beautiful constitution heralded across the world. Around 2010, we even coined the phrases of a developmental state, and there are a hive of activities were drawn into conferences, books are written on a developmental state. In everybody's lips, we talk of the Asian tigers. In 2012, a long-term vision, the National Development Plan, is adopted exactly 10 years ago. In the midst of all that, we even have moral regeneration, and it comes up with positive values. As moral regeneration was being adopted and pursued, the society was morally degenerating. Chapter 13 of the NDP speaks about the need for a capable ethical developmental state and how DG I wish it was made chapter one. Because any other thing in the other chapters will fail if you do not have state capacity. It was all predicated on a state that is strong, ethical, capable. But unfortunately, it was put in chapter 13. And, uh, fortunately, we are not that superstitious as in Europe and uh, North America where they say number 13 and on a Friday <laughs> means bad luck. There were different pronouncements on professionalization of public service. Professor Kada Asmal penned something to that effect. Dr. Vincent Mapai was also asked, they penned something. This is even before the NDP document. The late chairperson of the PSC, the founding chairperson, Professor Stan Sangweni, penned something about the need to professionalize public service. And there were several others. PSC itself, a few years ago, wrote about professionalization of public service. But what I want to speak to is the fact that with all these best policies, the country was moving in an opposite direction of regression. 
institutions were being weakened. We had the best constitution with a range of rights that even developed democracies could only envy. Our IEC was scooping prizes across the world because it was the model of an independent election management body. Our governance rules, King 1, 2, 3, and 4, and our audit systems were ranked in the top 10 in the world. Our financial systems and the banking system was seen as a model and the most viable. Can you believe that even ESCOM in 2001 was ranked the best state-owned company in the world? Security features in our currency in passports and IDs are more advanced than many of the advanced countries. But all these technical details, all these documents didn't help us from decline, from institutional weaknesses, from state capture. What happened? I go back to this missing link. Chinese empires built the Chinese wall. Nothing could cross that wall because it was so high if you have walked on that wall. It went thousands of miles. But there was one little problem. At the entrance gates, over time, guards could be corrupted. Which means we have built systems. We have rules. But we forgot to deal with the human factor. Because ultimately, it is a human being who should see to it that these things are done. So Chinese emperors started seeing people going through. They started seeing attacks because the guards were being bribed. They had invested on the wall, but forgot to invest on the human beings, their human consciousness, the values, and so forth. And here we are. We have the best systems. We just finished inspections of our forensic units. People fly from Europe to learn or see certain things. But the human factor is flawed. You remember in some of our universities we're even saying humanities, we should stop now, philosophy, we should stop because engineering is coming. Religious studies were dropped because we were moving into the high tech stage. But we didn't realize that even a computer with deep learning capacities and artificial intelligence cannot replace human values, ethics, consciousness. And that is the reason why we started developing this particular challenge. We invested on systems on policies, on rules. But we barely touch human consciousness. And some of the smartest people in the state capture and other investigations are technically sound, but morally flawed. 
So what do we do collectively to address that? The other problem that we suffered from as a country is that we tend to emphasize in our constitution rights but hardly ever talk about responsibilities and obligations. Every person, even the one who has done wrong, they insist on their rights. But the part of their brain and consciousness that has to deal with responsibility is dead. What can I get from the state? What can I get from the employer? I want to give you one example which almost made me to faint. You see, uh, Chairperson, when you go back to the public service as an academic, he said this person was on paid suspension. They forgot about him for 12 years. This person went to the university, did a degree, did LLB, did articles. And one day he shows up because he heard that there were performance bonuses to demand one. <laughs> That's the society that has gone mad with rights. But no responsibilities. People do wrong and they say, but what about my rights? And if you have enough money, you can keep justice at bay for 10 years. The other problem we have, which we have internalized with no scientific basis, the notion of South African exceptionalism. We are the only country on earth. We do not need to be compared. And therefore, social scientists can't do comparative analysis. Why? It's because we are just South Africa. We can't learn from anything. As a result, we learn about failure when we've failed. Then there is a conceptual stretch when we use terms such as, just liberally we use terms generously, such as Madibal magic. Yes, there was magic. Yes, there was this iconic leader. But most founding democracies, you do not replicate. You don't have Mandela every 10 years. A Gandhi comes once. A Roosevelt comes once in a while. A Churchill comes during the war time and disappears. It is left to you to be the leaders you've been waiting for so that you don't look for messiahs even in the unlikely places under the tables everywhere when in fact you ought to take responsibility. The other conceptual stretch we say, the day DG we said, we will embark on the road towards being developmental state. We said we're already developmental state. Once you give this honorary title to you, you do not then invest on how do I become a development st state because you have already said I am one. And of course, this next one might be a little bit controversial. Chairperson, we love as South Africans complex explanations, complex systems, complex solutions. Not because we want to see any solution. We are fascinated by the process. That's why when we're trying to source anyone to provide services, 
the one who confused you the most is the one you are likely going to appoint <laughs> thinking that is a sign of wisdom. <laughs> when confusion comes to confuse you, you will appoint someone else to decipher this Rosetta Stone code because it was never meant to be anything. It's just a clever person with a tablet or a MacBook. They hypnotize you with some presentations. <laughs> you start saying, mm -mm. that I couldn't even understand it. It means this person knows <laughs> what they're doing. <laughs> but you know what the problem is with that? You can't be transparent. You can't be accountable because this thing is complicated. It's only the elite. Even when you file your taxes, you have to get a tax professional. In other countries, you know exactly. You just get into the computer. You even know what is due to you, what is due. Here, it's a book, almost 100, 800 and something pages. That's why you have to employ other people. So it's a business model not to be understood by ordinary people. Everything is complicated here. Even when you join a contract, even in the private sector, you say, I'm joining this standard bank. Those who recruit you, when you say, I'm stuck here, they say, it was not us, it's another division. In fact, we can't even transfer you. Those who will answer you will tell you, no, no, it's another division, and so forth. So that complexity, we confuse it for effectiveness. And it is not. Everything you do to feel anything, we just complicate it. Now, I would have spoken about the interface between politics and administration. But let me just quickly run so that I highlight uh, the chairperson is already signaling. What has happened and what should be done? Samuel Johnson says, chains of habit are too light to be felt until they are too strong to be broken. When some of these habitual things were happening, we didn't feel them until they have fossilized around us that it's difficult to break them. And the question is, if we're promoting a new professional ethical institution, how do we learn to unlearn what we have learned in order to relearn? something new. Because the reality is that whatever professionalization you're talking about, 95% is people who are already in the system. Some have learned to steal, to lie, to do anything, to ill-treat the people on the other side. As a good university, help us think through what must be done. Because Alvin Toffler once wrote, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. What do we do to change the existing force which has learned other ways? But here is hope. When we called the Minister of Police and he brought in his generals and everybody else, we raised some of the issues about policing, protection of whistleblowers and so forth. He says something quite fundamental. He said, yeah, we do have police who are corrupt. And per year, sometimes we charge almost 1,000. We may fire 
close to 100. But he says, per year, there are more than 100,000 arrests conducted by the police, which means some police are doing their job. But there are those who are doing wrong things which may blemish the rest. And that is what we have found, that sometimes it's a leader, it's a wrong deployment there, it's a person who was incompetent put on top of professionals so their own fears tend to into toxic relationships. So how do we give oxygen to those who want to do the right thing? I just want to conclude by saying I won't go through the rest of what I've written. When a tree falls, it makes a loud noise. It makes news. But when you plant a forest, it hardly ever makes news. There are certain reforms which are taking place now that we have learned how dangerous it is to have a weakened system. And here collectively and individually, what must we do to make sure that those succeed? One, the Zondo Commission, the New Gen Commission, the PPE reports and several others, just to see people on live television sweating trying to explain themselves before you even go to anything being given water because it dehydrates to remember all those things. It makes the public to know the anatomy of corruption and fraud. It makes the person who used to go to their village and say, this is due to my hard work, this Range Rover in that seven million house, say, ah, so those things, before you even ask NPA to charge anybody, puts some people on the back foot. They become vulnerable. The reform of elections, even if they do not go all the way, again they are saying there are certain reforms to make sure that parties and individuals do account. Cabinet has just approved framework for professionalization of public service, and I encourage you to read all that. We fought and fought, remember this professionalization has been talked about for a decade. And all of a sudden, because everybody sees the damage that has occurred, and then you have this window of opportunity. Public Service Commission bill is being fast-tracked as a priority bill to make public service independent and to start biting. PAMA Act and several other reforms which are taking place. The introduction of lifestyle audit, if well implemented, where Figeni or his wife or kids will have to explain if you have this salary, Lama Rolls Royce, one house in Umhlanga, one house in Kems Bay, just explain to us you start invoking several financial intelligence institutions. You have signed. We start checking carefully. Good hour, Shinjani si motto. What's happening in your life? Which lotto did you win? Why all of a sudden your cousins have become tycoons as certain contracts are going out here? That allows for that. And you do not need to go back to the person and ask for permission. And lastly, as the chairperson is coming up, is to me, 
the question I've asked, met with Professor Nkutlu from the audit side, what is it that we should do so that government schools, business schools, where everybody who says I have an MBA, they start believing that I should be a DG or a CEO. What is it that is missing in the training programs? That technically these people are sound, but they could still have a flawed character. Met with Father Mangali Somkachwa and Professor Rosso of the Ethics Institute to say, what makes people know these ethics, and they even preach about them, but they continue to do unethical things. What must we do for deep immersion and conscientization such that this become intrinsic value that changes behavior? How to change the mindset and the institutional culture and how has it been done elsewhere? Can it be done if political leadership may be invested or certain people in the public service in the status quo? And what must we do jointly to turn that situation around? And if it is not you, who is going to do it? If it is not here, where is it going to be done? If it is not now, when is it going to be done? And the biggest challenge in any change or movement, it's when you externalize responsibility and say, I'll wait for my leaders, I'll wait for the handbook, instead of saying, I'll start with myself. And that starting with yourself in the whole ecosystem starts in the family. What values are there? In the school, in the media, in the tertiary institutions. What values are we dealing with? Thank you. We can give that round of applause again. Why are you giving a round of applause? The one I asked for was for me, so you, you understood it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's the power of the podium. So how do I unlearn? To follow instructions that are illegal so that I can relearn to follow instructions, I understand. Can we clap hands again? Why are you clapping hands? You see, the power of positional power is that for the base of where I am, I can make these people do what they would not do otherwise. With me knowing why they, I want them to do it and them not knowing why they are doing it the ethical implications of positional leadership. Thank you very much. <laughs> and without much further ado, um, and I am going to invite uh, the head of the of audit at the office of the Auditor General, uh, Ms. Bongi Ngoma, uh, to join us. Um, can we clap hands for her? <laughs> uh, it's an honor, uh, Mamgo. Um, and then I'm going to ask uh, Tasnim Karim, who, uh, who is from the GCIS, Government Communications and Information Systems. Um, please join us. Thank you. Can you give a big hand? <laughs> and I'm going to also invite Rachel Fisher from the Organization for Undoing of Tax Avoidance or Tax Abuse. That's a huge mission. Eh? Can we give a big hand? <laughs> Tax abuse. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a, a very gender balanced session. Uh, I am very happy about it. 
So I'm going to remove myself from it and I'm going to invite the, the colleagues to make their views. Briefly, we have about an hour, uh, including Q&A. So I'm going to ask colleagues if they can just limit their um, inputs to about 10 minutes and it is on accountability and state-owned enterprises. Um, in light of what um, uh, Professor Figeni has already mentioned, so I will start with uh, Ms. Ngoma, and then they will then set up the, the, pre, the, the PowerPoint presentation uh, for, for TASNIM. You need a PowerPoint presentation? It was sent, but I can speak. About that. Yeah. Because the power is in you, not in the no, PowerPoint. No, Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Yeah, what an honor to be in your midst this morning, um, especially to be in the midst of Dr. Figeni. I think it's a dream come true for me as a young village girl coming from Zolo, the impoverished province, having studied here at Natal University. So when I arrived this morning, something in me moved because I'm back where I was shaped and where I was made. That was thought-provoking, provoking, provoking uh, Dr. Figeni. So on the assignment that I was given, I think it, dove, it does dovetail to the discussion that you, you just shared with us this morning. I'll start very quickly with the vision of the Office of the Audit General, very, very briefly. So we exist to strengthen democracy, and we do that by enabling oversight, accountability, and governance. But most importantly, we build public confidence. And I just want to touch very briefly on things that can diminish public confidence before we can even talk about building, which we are all aware of. And, and some of those things I think you, you touched on, uh, Dr. Figeni, uh, issues of poor service delivery. I think we all experience those, the levels of unemployment that are increasing, especially among our youth, um, you, you find the youth that is becoming restless, misuse of uh, state funds, but most importantly, lack of accountability for those who are misusing state funds. So I'm trying to get to a question you asked uh, towards the end of your presentation, Dr. Figeni, where you said, what is it that then must be done? These people are technically sound, but then morally decayed. Where is the problem statement? I think some of the issues lie on the lack of consequences that we began to experience in our country. It's a whole host of things, of course, but I think one of those things lie in the lack of consequence management for wrongdoing. I'm going to just touch on two things. I think if I were to present on the failures in performance in what we've audited over the years, I would need a full day. But I'm just going to touch on two things this morning. I'm going to talk about the weaknesses in performance, planning, and reporting. That is number one. And then I'm going to talk about the weaknesses that we've picked up in the infrastructure space. So I'm just going to limit my, my discussion to those two. Because I think we all know about the other issues around why we experience poor audit outcomes within our local government, our entities, our, de our departments. I think we all know by now. So our government have got great systems, just latching on what you shared, uh, Dr. Figeni. Around the planning, budgeting, reporting cycle, there's a great system that was established by, by the government, and it flows from the National Development Plan, from the MT. SF, that is the medium term strategic framework. So this is a model that flows from that. And this model talks about a need for the NTT department, um, local government, municipality, so a need to create a strategic plan over five years. So there's that requirement. And that strategic plan must flow from the NDP. Ne? Following that, the APPs, the annual performance plans, and the budgets. I'm worried about the chair keeps looking at me. So the APPs must be developed, followed by implementation, reporting, and then year-end reporting 
all that culminate into an annual report. So there is that beautiful process that exists uh, in our country. So we have audited effectiveness of this process around performance information. And what we have picked up is that the aspirations that lie in the NDP, I think we all know those aspirations, risk being compromised or not achieved, mainly because of the quality of the APPs, the annual performance plans. What do I mean? The indicators that are sitting in the MTSF, in the NDP, are missing, are not found in these APPs. And then how are you going to achieve what you do not even measure? We don't even get to measure these aspirations that sit in the NDP back in our APPs. Plus, the quality of the indicators sometimes don't even talk to the mandates and the functions of the departments. That's the second uh, finding that we picked up. Thirdly, the quality of these indicators, the things that we measure, that the departments measure, are, are input driven, are not outcomes or output driven, are not talking to the impact that we want to see on the ground. So there's a tendency to measure things like the number of meetings. I hope we're not measuring this conference as well as an achievement tick. In <laughs> so there's no direct linkage to what sits in the NDP in terms of what the departments measure. Then if you look at the sectors across your health, water, roads, there's no consistency in terms of all these provinces, what they measure. There's no standardization. There was a document that was developed by DMPE, a DPME. I'm a bit disappointed the DG is not here, it's a DG. Here. There was a, um, there's a document, a great document guideline that they've developed on how to create consistencies in these indicators. But it remains a good document again, not implemented. In terms of what we've seen around the, these indicators that are not of good quality, I'll just give you a few examples that will resonate with you. Let's talk about the issue of eradication of um, bucket sanitation system, the bead toilet system. I think those who are in the villages would understand what it is. It sits squarely in the NDP that there is that aspiration to eradicate, great aspiration, but you won't find it measured anyway. Now, how are you going to achieve what you don't measure? Last example I'm gonna make on the title deeds that must be registered. There's an aspiration to transfer houses to a number of individuals, but few of the, the ODTs have got that as an indicator to drive. Now, reconciling what sits in the MTSF quickly to what we see as an achievement. I'm gonna be quick. Let's take the issue of dams. There's an aspiration that says uh, nine, nine dams have got to be rehabilitated so that there's continuous supply of water in the, in the country. But three years on, three years later, so we've got a five-year uh, MTSF. Three years later, only one dam was rehabilitated. Let's take the case of train uh, stations. There was an aspiration to modernize all 33 train stations but three years on, none has been modernized. So what does it tell us? There is a risk of achievement of those aspirations that sit squarely in the NDP. Now on the issue of the infrastructure, very quickly, I'm gonna be quick on this one because I, I believe we all understand the, um, the shortfalls in this environment. And infrastructure is big in terms of um, creation of jobs, aspirations in the NDP, growth of GDP, and uh, alleviating the unemployment pressures, very big in achieving that, the economic recovery in the country. But on performing the audits year after year, we have been noting deficiencies around project management practices. We, we, we're not good at even analyzing the needs. What is it that is required? Contractors are appointed that cannot even perform the work. Once they are appointed, they are not supervised or monitored to ensure that the projects are concluded. I think we all are aware of this. And then there are no consequences for those who don't 
complete or conclude the project. And what does this then result in? You see a lot of projects that are delaying. They take years to be concluded. There's a project that was started in, in Eastern Cape, uh, in Butterworth, uh, my, my home place, uh, RDP project. Two minutes, R RDP project. That project, 10 years later, has not been concluded. The some of the beneficiaries who were supposed to benefit have even passed on. Project has been abandoned, is being vandalized. That's what we see. I want to run quickly now to the solution because I've got two minutes to go. What is it that we are recommending? We'll continue to recommend. Uh, we will be relentless in auditing and recommending what needs to change and how to enhance uh, accountability in our country. So if you look at the word accountability, it's a grammatical construct of two words. There's the word account, there's the word ability. That makes up accountability which then means it will be difficult to account if you do not have the abilities. There's also another one I want to introduce which talks about capabilities. Capabilities enables accountability. And capabilities is broad because the issue of ethics is competencies, it's systems, it's policies, it's processes, it's oversight, it's reporting, and it's also ethics. So capability is the one that will enable accountability in our country. So what we are recommending, and we'll continue to recommend these things, is that we need to go back to the basics of appointing capable and qualified people. We need to then allow those people to do their jobs, give them tenure. We need to go back to stronger project management disciplines. We need to go back and plan thoroughly. And then ask ourselves, as we shape these indicators, are they going to produce the desired outcomes that we are looking for? We need to go back to the disciplines of in-year monitoring, evaluation, correction, Implementation of consequences must become a non-negotiable. Financial prudence is what we need in, sp in, in light of the limited resources that we are confronted with. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to invite Rachel to follow um, and while we set up the PowerPoint for TASNAM. Uh, Rachel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Yesterday, a couple of times it was said, all protocol observed. But um, coming from Pretoria, Johannesburg, Gauteng, I would like to say, all potholes observed. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's be honest, right? This is the reality of many of our communities. And I stand here proudly as a representative of the organization Undoing Tax Abuse. You might know us as the organization that fought for more than 10 years um, against the e-tolling system in Gauteng that was declared to come to an end uh, following our MTPBS not long ago. And what we do, our mandate, is to hold government to account as to how they use, utilize, and report back on tax that our citizens are paying. Now, there is this conception that we are anti-government, and we are not anti-government. Our aim is to be anti-maladministration and corruption. Therefore, for us, it is very important in order to collaborate with a variety of entities to fight against this. Now, standing here following the gravitas of Dr. Fikeni, once again, it is an honor. And I would like to refer to the MTSF indicating priority number one, which is being a capable, ethical, and developmental state. To achieve this, we need a collaboration between regulatory bodies, civil society organizations, as well as ethics development. Now, this is coming across quite often within our presentations now. So if we are looking for ethical leadership, we need to look at three principles. And this is from the former public protector, Tuli Madonsela. We need people who are most competent, most trustworthy, and least selfish. We need to trust their integrity to do the right thing. How do we achieve this? And I would like to refer back to our collaboration. We firmly believe that we need to collaborate with civil society, with government, and the private sector. 
No man and no institution is an island. And for us to be effective and putting our strengths together, we can battle the various weaknesses that we may be facing. One of the core focus areas also for the organization on doing tax abuse is also looking at parliamentary oversight. So to see in the balance and the separation of powers between the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive, how does parliament conduct proper oversight of the executive? They are the ones that must be asking very tough questions. As was just indicated, part of what we also do is looking at the budget review and recommendation reports. And currently parliament is busy with that process where parliament and the portfolio committees are interrogating the annual performance plans, UXA's reviews and recommendations, financial reports, to see are the departments meeting their mandates. We also want to see how does the portfolio committee take into consideration research recommendations by academics. Now, we established yesterday, this room is full of smart people. We are hosted by the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Do you find that your research and recommendations are being implemented by government? How many civil society or even private sector entities are using your hard-won findings as academics? We all know that saying of publish or perish. And those of you as supervisors, how many articles, how many dissertations are lying on the shelves and not utilized to their full potential? So we can collaborate in this space. Now, I would like to consider, back to our ethics point, is that circumstances and priorities change over time, but good values do not go out of fashion. So if portfolio committees then look at these, we call them BRS, the Budgetary Review and Recommendation Reports, we want to see that then translated into the annual performance plans. We want to see how portfolio committees and parliament is dedicated to achieving those priority areas. And that is also then why as a civil society organization, we conduct this oversight. Now for us, it's very important to consider integrity, capacity building, and accountability. Integrity is one of the organization's core organizational values. And we would like to refer to Dr. Terence Lombebe, and he was a chairperson for ethics and the Anti-Corruption Council. And he has proposed an integrity compact. And that means that we agree for this call for much more meticulous vetting, screening, and publicly informed induction programs for new public officials. But Dr. Fikeni also told us numerous occasions, if we look at ethics or values, how do we make it part of our consciousness? Not something that we try and remember as rules and regulations captured in our codes of conduct and we will be punished if we do not achieve this. We want values and ethics to become ingrained in our psyches. Now you can refer back to all the philosophers with deontological and virtue ethics and utilitarianism and social justice by John Stuart Mill. And not everybody here, you know, when you think of ethics and philosophy, you're like, oh, this is so hard. I didn't study humanities for this. But humanities is important. We need that for critical thinking and to ha ask hard questions. So ethics then, looking in our workspace, whether as public or private sector or academics, is the alignment between our internal value systems with our external environment. If you are working at an institution or an organization where there is conduct that you do not agree with, you ought to walk away. If there is no alignment, you do become desensitized and systematically you start to agree with the actions that are taking place. So let us take the philosophers and flip it around and see what are the values that we agree with. We look at character. What is our character and our moral compass? If we behave a certain way, are our parents going to be proud of us? That is a very important question. What will my mom say? Or what will God say? What does our religion say? Will my children be proud of me? We have to ask ourselves, what is our duty? What is our duty toward ourselves, our families, our organization, 
our religion to God? Are we achieve, achieving our duties and obligations? Many times within this conference so far, we have looked at consequence management. But let us make consequence management a personal thing. What are the consequences of my actions, long-term and short-term? Are we going to get punished, disciplinary hearings, or am I going to feel this in a way that goes against my character? How does this affect my community? Will they end up having more potholes or bad toilet systems, not having water infrastructure? These are very important questions for us to ask. We need to achieve justice. We need to care for our communities. There's a very important, well-known saying, and I do hope I pronounce it properly, but moto ke moto kabato, the principle of Ubuntu, I am because we are. There is another well-known African proverb that says, the best time to plant a forest is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Now, we don't achieve planting forests on our own. We have to work together across all spheres of society. And that means with government, civil society organizations, academics, and the private sector. Let us not wait and only reflect on what has occurred 20 years ago, but let us reflect and act on what is occurring here and now at this conference. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much for teaching me to unlearn how to watch the watch. You already had watched it yourself. You rendered me very useless with my counter there. <laughs> so I was waiting to say, three minutes. <laughs> you already had done it. You know a Suzuki Swift? It is white in color. It's KR32ZWGP. You come all the way from Gauteng to leave your lights on. That thing is causing climate warming <laughs> in the hills of Umbilo. Uh, please switch it off. Uh, climate change, climate change, my brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chasnem. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I do need a presentation, and I was feeling a little bit guilty when Prof was talking about people coming up with clever, clever presentations that are aimed at confusing you. <laughs> That's not my aim. Uh, it's just that this, my mind is so full of so many things. I need some slides to, to help me take us rationally through this. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to find a link to, there, there are many, many links, but I think, um, let me start off by appreciating the previous speakers, and especially Prof. Ikeni, who uh, very beautifully uh, crafted the discomfort and pain we're all feeling uh, about where we are. <clears throat> and I agree with him about everything, except one thing. I don't think we have the time to change our habits slowly. And I think I'm going to uh, take you through this presentation, um, which I'll try and rush through uh, because of the time limit, um, which will demonstrate uh, why uh, we don't have the time, I think. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, some research we took to Cabinet uh, a few weeks ago where we, we met uh, with the Public Service Commission and it, it, it was very apt that the two presentations followed each other because one spoke about the communications framework of government and the other one spoke about um, building a professional public service. Um, I'm going to rush through some of these slides but let me just say that um, you, you know, the research that we conduct at the GCIS are a public good. So anybody that is interested 
any PhD student, uh, master's student, honors, anybody, any academics who want access to it, uh, you're welcome to contact us. Uh, don't become a pain, just send us a nice email <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to help you. Um, but anyway, let me, let me dr uh, drive through it. I think it would be fair to say that we've had an Annus Horribilis. And I think it would be also fair, I don't know if any Latin speakers in the room, the pl plural of Annus hor Horribilis. I suppose it would be Annie Horribly. We've had a few bad years. Uh, just coming out of HIV and uh, state capture and then COVID, floods, you name it. We've had horrible, horrible year. Um, and even in this, I think Prof. Fikeni even mentioned, there are some glimmers of hope. Um, and it's the glimmers of hope are the things that we, good, the good people, have got to latch on to. But I'm not going to dwell on some of the good and some of the bad. Just to share with you, we conduct uh, ongoing research, both qualitative and quantitative on perceptions of South Africans. Uh, it's a representative survey. Um, and uh, we've been doing this since 2002. So we have a lot of data. And some of the things we measure are, is uh, one of, these are one of the things we measure. Uh, it's called direction of the country. And it's kind of a confidence indicator. Um, and, you know, in the first administration, uh, post-democracy, we had quite a lot of positivity and it stayed with us uh, until 2008. And then, uh, like in many other countries, uh, you know, we've had uh, international and domestic issues which have caused confidence to dip. And as you can see, the red line, which is those people who think that uh, South Africa is moving in the wrong direction, has crossed over the green twice. And we're at a point where 74% of the population think that the country is going in the wrong direction. We're not alone in this. Uh, we, um, Ipsos conducts this survey and uh, it's done with um, 28 countries. And uh, you can see uh, that where we are sitting is um, in some bad company where um, you know, uh, we think the kind of things that are happening in those countries uh, are actually happening to, to us as well. So um, this, is, this is where we are in terms of uh, how, the, how uh, our people think that uh, the country's the direction is moving in. Also an Ipsos one, um, it's uh, what South Africa worries about as compared to the rest of the world. Um, remember, it's only 28 countries, but still it gives you a sense. And for us, unemployment, corruption, um, crime and violence, uh, we worry about those things a lot, as we should. Uh, we worry less about inflation and some of the uh, issues related to our financial institutions and so on. We ask people what they think the main challenges are that government should address. And forever, since we've been doing this survey, uh, unemployment has cited, no surprise, unemployment has been cited as the number one challenge. It sits high up there. Look at the gap between unemployment and all of the other challenges. We saw since uh, 2008, 2009, we saw uh, issues around corruption a uh, crime, um, you know, all the safe, safety, lo uh, law and order issues uh, becoming uh, more prevalent. Um, we saw roads, the issue around roads uh, creeping into uh, the top challenges that people identified. But more recently, uh, in a post-COVID world, we saw poverty and destitution becoming um, the number two challenge. So we know that people are facing hunger. And it's not something that we don't know, it's just that the research is here to prove it. The GCIS has established a segmentation model, um, which we think is much better than the LSMs. It's also publicly available and it's on Telma, for those of you who use Telma. Um, 
And in this model, uh, the bulk of the population sits in a segment called rooted realists, um, and that's 27.8 million people. And those are people uh, generally older and younger people, and they are, um, we call them rooted because most of the time these people know who they are and why they're here, and they're also quite patient. Uh, and they're the ones that are most likely to say Rome wasn't built in a day. So uh, for them, the issues are slightly different. They relate to water, roads, poverty, so on. The chairperson has already told me I have four minutes left and there's no way I'm gonna finish in four minutes, so he's gonna have to drag me off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the next issue is about trust. You've learned all of yesterday and today. Trust is on the decline. What's disturbing is uh, the four, a few disturbing things. One is it's about trust in institutions, and I'm sure you all know that since 2008, trust in all institutions worldwide is declining. So what does that say about the individual and where they get their sense of stability from? So that's, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a problem, but in South Africa, one of the disturbing trends is that trust in government has had a ridiculously rapid decline. And uh, we did a quick regression analysis on the latest indicators and we found that the latest reason for the further drop in trust relate to security issues, relate to health issues, relate to human settlement and social welfare. And those are usually the indicators where the public perceive government to be doing well. So even in the areas where we perform well, we've done bad. Okay, so this is um, a summary of uh, qualitative research that we've done, and uh, it outlines the segments, and you can see that, uh, you know, for those at the higher, those ones who, have, who are rich enough to take the capital and move anywhere else in the world, life was okay for them. It was bad, it was good, it was everything. But if you look at the population um, that w the rooted realists, for them, life is just heavy. That's the only word that they can use to describe it. Also at the bottom of the slide, uh, we've, we've, um, we've, uh, we've aggregated the indicators on specific uh, areas. And what we can see is that public perception, as I've already mentioned, on health, um, social welfare, uh, employment and growth, and local government have all dropped quite dramatically. So I'm going to rush through the next few slides, but as I said, you're welcome to use it. You can see um, public perception on education issues uh, broadly in general, and specific indicators have dropped. So that means the public perceive government not to be doing so well on education. About 61% of the population think that government's doing okay. And um, this one here is on health. We've also had drops, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, and then um, social grants, which is where in general since around 1996, uh, the public have perceived government to be doing well has had a dramatic drop. And uh, this mostly relates to people being able to access uh, the poverty relief grant. Building houses has always been rated quite poorly and there is no difference in this. Crime and corruption is about 23% of the population, 23% of the population who think that government's doing an okay job, a good job. That, that's quite scary. Uh, managing immigration, 17% of the population think that. Um, and this one is always the worst, because if you go back to the slide that tells you that unemployment is the biggest challenge, and then you look at government's track record in terms of public perception on things economic, uh, it's really bad. Um, I wish we had more time but to, to go through these, but I do need to rush through them. Um, local government uh, has always been rated quite poorly, but um, 
we have to say that when you look specifically at the supply of water and supply of electricity, it hasn't had that bad a rating, except in the last uh, quarter, uh, where there seems to have been a sudden drop. So, um, also, um, this is something that does give us a bit of a glimmer of hope. We still have about 76% of the population who still feel that they're proud to be South African. And we also have about 64% of the population who are confident of a happy future. Now that's something to work with. Uh, happy future for all races, it is something to work with. So what we recommended to cabinet and what we want to say to you. You know, the one thing that I don't agree with what uh, Prof. Fikeni said, I think, and please excuse my French now, I think if you're working in government or you're working with government, you've got to find catalytic actions that will help you cut through the crap. So you've got to find the actions that will make a change. Not tomorrow, next, not next year, today. And some of those link to some of the things we're talking about. So first of all, one of the things that we're saying to frontline departments, and we just said it to Home Affairs two weeks ago, if you're a DG or a minister, how often do you go and stand in your own queue and see how you're treating people? See how your department's treating people. Call your own call center and see how people are being treated. So we're saying, can we start putting the citizens first? Can we start thinking about our planning in terms of the citizens and not in terms of everything else? So that's some of the things that we have recommended. The second thing is that, and I'm sorry, Chairperson, but I'm going to spend two minutes on this. There has to be a campaign <laughs> from DPSA specifically, and it has to be a stronger campaign with some good investment in it. And it has to be a campaign that says to public servants, you have a higher purpose. It's not just a job. You are not just getting a salary. Your purpose is to change South Africa for the better. Because if you've excluded performance management and you've excluded uh, you know, uh, the ethical issues and you've excluded the training and the qualifications and all of that, what do you have? You have an ethical value system that must drive people. In 1994, we made a big mistake. And one of the mistakes that, well, many big mistakes, but this is the one big mistake we made, a big one. When we integrated all the public service, we thought that we thought that somehow we would evolve into a, a you know, unified South African value system that you know, incorporated the former Bantu stance and homelands and, and the incoming you know, um, liberation movements and everything. And we thought it would evolve. Wrap up. Okay, I'm that gonna wrap means. up. So that's why I'm saying we made a mistake then. There isn't a single ethical value system that defines that is defines the public service, and we need one. So we're calling on DPSA to do it. Um, and also, um, the other thing that we have said to cabinet is that people need to be able to respond to the citizens. If you don't do it now quickly, definitively, and, it, and with action, then we've got a, we're sitting on a time bomb. Thank you. The last one, last oh, slide. Unfair, very unfair. Okay. Ethical. Ethical. Uh, is that, uh, I think, the, the last slide, I think the, the, there is a campaign we're recommending, and Prof, just to let you know, it is about citizens' rights and responsibilities, because the citizens also have a responsibility. I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, my, my friendly advice, Tasneem, would have been not to present the research in a plenary, but to present those reflections you are doing at the, at the end. Because research you present in breakaway sessions, not in plenaries. Um, so that last part bit was what we actually really needed 
really groundbreaking, insightful, and all of that, not the actual data. They will get that in breakaways. Thank you very much, though. Much appreciated. Um, I, I, I gave you five more minutes than others, so I was ethical. Uh, <laughs> so I had just to avoid making it 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Much appreciated at this point. Um, um, I was going to take uh, about eight uh, questions, uh, but uh, I would donate the other two uh, because we have already taken more time. Can I see by show of hands those who want to, um, to ask a question? Um, uh, I'm going to start at the back. Um, I'll start with one, and then it is two, and then I see, oh, okay. I'll start afresh. i start uh, at the back, the three people at the back, and then I'll just, I see number three here, I think, and then there is a gentleman right at the back. Uh, are the microphones roving? Um, the ethics of microphones. <laughs> yeah, right at the back, very last row. You can speak then. I think we don't have a mic. Just speak. Thank you very much. No, no, no. There's, a, there's somebody there. Ask. There, there. One, two, right at the back. One, two, three, four, five. Ethics, and then I'll come to you. My ethics. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Very Just unfamiliar a... face, yes. <laughs> Just a quick question, um, if not uh, a comment, uh, for particularly uh, my colleague from Outer, but I guess the question is, all, is for all of us. Uh, you made a very important statement, uh, a statement in the form of a question, <laughs> Uh, that uh, how much of research is taken into consideration by government. Um, I, I think the problem is bigger than that. Uh, because I recently interacted with a very interesting study which says that academics that conduct research get it published Often, their peers themselves do not read that research. In other words, academic research often get read, particularly if you want to publish it by the editor, the peer reviewers, and that's where it ends. So I just wanted to say that the question of how much do we take into account the research that comes from academia um, it's easy to, uh, to, to ask, but I think, I think there are many issues that are related to that question that need to be taken into account. In a nutshell, all what I'm trying to say is that the reason we don't really read much, <laughs> including the very same people that are actually generating research. You know, so that's, that's, that's just a question or rather the comment that I wanted to make. That there is also another side of the story that we need to begin to pay closer attention to. Thanks. Thank you very much. Can you pass the mark to your right? There uh, is a, some other. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, got a thank mic. you so much. You introduce uh, yourself and then you ask a question. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Kiawa Katsolo from the Institute of Pan African Thought and Conversation. And You're my welcome. question is to Dr. Fikeni on, on his address. I liked how he ended the address by talking about the agents of political socialization. But my question then, speaking on the ethics and how we can account as public, my question is. The truth is most South African families are broken due to the moral degeneration Doc spoke of. It is from this point that we have seen and witnessed the ruling party capitalize on this vulnerability of campaigning for the future by using and weaponizing the past. Talking about the liberation struggle and using Madiba as uh, a symbol of legitimacy. So my question is how do we then learn to differentiate the past and the present in order we to, to, to account and have our politicians and government account right now? Oh, hey, you ask a PhD question. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there was someone just in front of you. I, I, I envy the speakers who must answer this question. Yeah. yeah I, I think there's someone to your right. To your right yeah, thanks. And then 
we come down here and then we come here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Yabule Lachefu. I'm working in the DPSA. Uh, my question is around uh, the observation which, which was done by Umis Ngoma mm -hmm. around the major challenges that are affecting the state performance. I think I fully agree with, with, with her observation. However, personally, I think the biggest problem in 2012 when, uh, when the, the NDP was developed, what then was missing is the, is the indicator framework on how to track right, those, those, those uh, are targets that are, are, are within the, the NDP. Yes. However, we need also to acknowledge the reforms that were, were, were introduced by the government of today to ensure that you have the MTSF and also the recent uh, NAPS, which is National Strategic Framework, I mean, st a National Annual Strategic Framework. But again, I was not clear with her recommendation, right? Because firstly, even though I appreciate that most of the department, they are not bold enough to track the things that are going to assist to achieve what uh, 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 contains in the NDP, right? Yeah. But however, you will find even now today, uh, most of the department are, are, are putting process or output things. We are shy away about putting the outcome indicators or kind of the things that we don't really uh, 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 want to wish to achieve. But I wanted right. to check from her, what is it that AG yes. right, is going to do in order to ensure yes. we are putting a, a government to move from uh, gear one to gear two? Because yeah. I think currently... Yeah. I think you made a point. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay yeah. thanks. Uh, and it's a very good point. Uh, Yes. Because Do you want to make a second or, or yes, you because finish? Just to, just Please to wrap add, up. Yeah. Yes, just to add on what I was saying, you will find out currently most of the department are uh, obtaining clean audit. But the biggest question, what does that clean audit mean to the citizens? So I think uh, AG must, must, must encourage department to move from gear one to gear two. So yes, that's why, thanks. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I, I like gear two. Definitely. And, and I, I come to, uh, to Suya there. And then uh, I, I, you have some there? Thank you. Okay, yeah, and then I will come here. Thank yes, you. sir. Thank you so yes, much, thank you. Chin. Thank you for um, the pen. I thought a really, really interesting um, discussions. I, I, I appreciated all of them. I wanted to just start at the back on the issue of ethics and accountability and um, the, the statement that there isn't a single ethical value system. And I'm taking also from the fact that we're here sitting in the College of Humanities, the built environment, development and engineering. And the, the difficulty is that if you, when you work in the development and the engineering and the, and the planning fields, it's not, it's not a, a process where you can say, it's not a, a financial, like a financial process where you can add two, three together with four and you get um, seven. Mm. I had to work that out quickly. Um, <laughs> development is not a straight line process and the difficulty is when you're expected at the beginning of a financial year to say exactly what you're going to do and then what you have done and if there's any discrepancy in that then it's clearly you, you're the wrong person for the job demonstrates a, a, a misunderstanding of how the development process works and for as long as we criminalise um, the people in government who are, who are trying to do their best in a very difficult non-linear process I think we're going to have a problem with the perceptions of the public sector. The media very easily uh, pick up on, oh, you know, wasteful expenditure. But often it's just the fact that the, the development process is not straightforward. Thanks, Jay. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I have a hand there, and then I'm, I come here. I'll come to it. Thank you very much. Um, you have the mic. Yes, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sonel Mbambo from the School of Built Environment and Development Studies uh, in UKZN. Uh, it's both a, a comment and, and a question. Uh, I think the, for me, the most interesting part of the National Development Plan is where it uh, says uh, uh, we need to promote uh, or develop active citizenry. 
of which I think by doing that, the NDP was trying to correct the mistakes of the RDP, uh, where we portrayed our uh, the incoming government of, of the post apartheid states as a Father Christmas that would be able uh, to provide everything uh, for citizens. And then the citizens uh, must go to Slumberland and wait for the government to do everything. Uh, that part of the NDP further says that uh, uh, the government cannot act on behalf of the people, but it must act with the people. Mm. And uh, the problems that we have encountered post-1994 is that we have uh, uh, prioritized uh, political activism more than social activism. That is why in South Africa today, I think if I am correct, you have more than uh, six, uh, 600 political parties. Uh, you have, uh, we cry so much uh, corruption, but we do not uh, question uh, the responsibility of the legislature in, in holding the executive accountable. Yeah. So in 10 years of the N NDP, how much ha have we then ensured the development of active citizens? Because it says that this plan cannot be implemented without that part of building uh, active city. Well emphasized. Uh, the, uh, the last thing, uh, Chair, is that uh, th there was a question on uh, how much of the published uh, research is utilized. I think that is a secondary question. We should ask uh, primary questions like, for researchers, how long do, uh, does it take for them to obtain gatekeepers' letters from government de departments, we should uh, help them to obtain ethical clearance for, uh, 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 from the institutions. Because my experience in one of the, the researches I have done is that it took me more than seven months to obtain or to get a gatekeeper's letter after from a, div, a, yeah. a government a yes. department. So those are, are the yeah. primary problems on that past tense. Thank you. Thank you. And then the, a long standing hand decide, uh, otherwise, consequence management might come my direction. So, yes, sir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm Nelson. I'm an ME candidate from politics and IR at the University of Johannesburg. So, I, I, did, I missed that. So, my name is Nelson. I'm an ME candidate um, okay. politics and IR at the University of Johannesburg. All so, right, thank you. My question goes to Ms. Nguma. Um, um, at the last audit, um, only 16% of um, municipalities got a clean audit. And I quickly want to read a quote from the AG. What we are looking at this year's audit outcome is that there is no improvement in the status of transparency, accountability, performance, or integrity of local government. And we've not seen an improvement in the last four or five years. Now, in your presentation, you made something about saying we'll continue recommending, but if there's no improvement in four or five years, it means that possibly we cannot continue recommending. And now, people's well-being are at stake. So beyond recommending, what, um, does the Office of the AG have any concrete plan to ensure that these municipalities are held accountable so that people who are supposed to get the dividends of democracy are actually getting it? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And I recognize the hand here. I can still go as one more hand on my left. Um, I said on my left, my brother, uh, but I hear, I hear your cry. I'm not a bad father. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Thank, thank uh, the mic with the, the sister. Right there. Oh, okay, oh, it's fine. Okay. That, yes, thank, thank you, um, Chair. I think my question goes to um, Professor Somadot on the ethical reflection issues. Um, I, I see what uh, Ms. Karim has actually presented on the slides. I'm a number person. Um, and what you are presenting, you're saying that while the commission doesn't um, trust government, but they do trust religion, religious organizations. And I think my question is, how do we use that to our advantage? Uh, because if there is some ethics still sitting in the religious organizations or NGOs, and we have access to it, and we know that these organizations have open arms, they do want to be used, they do want to participate in government, whether we can start looking strategically on how we involve them 
uh, into picking up on the government and ensuring that our ethical fabric uh, also thickens up. So that's my question. Thanks. Thank you. Can you pass the mic to the just behind you? Um, that gentleman there. Uh, uh, yeah. The, the, thank you, Chair. Um, I can see he's got you uh, mumbling, so I will have to learn from, from uh, him. Uh, please, please give the mic because I feel very sorry for him. He's very keen. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Chairperson, and, and thank you to all the presenters. I think we started today, uh, the morning, with some thought-provoking uh, uh, presentations. So the question that I'm going to ask is going to cut across all the presentations, yeah. and let me give context to, to it. Yes. Starting with what Tasnim has said, 74% of the public op opinion is that the country is going into the wrong direction. Mm. AG's presentation indicates that, indeed, things are not working in mm. terms of our accountability on state-owned entities, weakened in, uh, weak, uh, weaknesses in planning, performance, and monitoring. Outta, you indicated how we needed to hold everybody accountable yes. from state, private, uh, uh, civil society. In 2012, Prof., and now I'm coming to the concept of the developmental state. Because these decisions that we take, we must take them and keep on reflecting. So when 2010 we say we're adopting a developmental state, then 2012 the NDP comes. It gives ESCOM a, a target of ensuring the seven to, between 7 to 9 percent of the reserve margin insofar as security of supply is concerned. We know where we are today. So the question then that cuts across is, are we, with this performance, that we all agree that is going to the south, are we slowly gravitating towards a failed developmental state? Perfect question. And Thank you very much. And if not, Thank you. what is it that we are doing right that we must maintain? And if we are, yeah. what are the things that we need to do so that we can then start developing a country risk? Perfect. Thank you. Perfect question. Can you pass it to your left? You still can you pass it before we move in there. Um, and then that, that, uh, that's why I close. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Chair. You're and welcome. I want to thank all the speakers. My name is Pumla Nongoba. I'm from DPSA. Yes. Um, yes. Mine is a kind of a comment just to add to what uh, Professor Figeni was saying in terms of the um, the example that he gave about uh, an employee who has been on precautionary suspension for almost 10 years. Mm. So what I want to say is that uh, to add to what he was saying, because he didn't finish uh, what happened with that employee, yes. but to say, can we blame the employee for going back and ask for, uh, what was it, a bonus? Mm. Because again, we need to think about those that have forgotten him. The consequence yeah. management yes. must also look at those who have forgotten him. Because yes. if a person is on precautionary suspension, you have yes. not charged that person. So yes. you don't know whether the person has done wrong or has not done wrong. Yes. And the mere fact that they took about 10 years yes. to do that, it means you don't even have anything against this person. But it might be another thing but i'm just saying no. uh, much as the person has done something wrong but uh, i mean you go and do your articles when yeah. you are supposed to be available anytime thank much, you much appreciated we close there with that brother who uh, was itching to say something no thanks chair and i met your message uh, chair thank you um my name is Hamilton Tuli. i'm from national treasure my question is directed to Umem Ngoma. Uh, there's a recently concluded evaluation, a repeat evaluation that was done by our colleagues at DPME on planning, monitoring, and evaluation. Um, it identified uh, one of the reasons uh, that uh, the, the, uh, the department's uh, your performance plans are littered with this activity and process indicators um, as being uh, the department solely planning for the audit process. 
uh, we're no longer planning, departments are not planning to make impact or change lives, it's just to meet uh, the audit requirements because uh, the techniques that are used by AG uh, to audit non-financial performance information are the very same techniques that are used for the audit of financial performance information and the, those two don't work. So one of the recommendations from that evaluation was that uh, the audit of financial performance information should, uh, should be delinked from uh, the audit of non-financial performance information. So I wanted yeah. to find out if AG is aware of, of that. Are we working towards ensuring that uh, department just do not plan to meet uh, those assertions of usefulness, completeness that are currently being uh, audited by uh, AG on the financial side of things. Thank you. Thank you much. I appreciate it. Um, uh, thank me for, thank for you, pointing Chair. at you. Thank you. It's, it's ethical. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, um, I, I did not exclude the people who are online. We did not have a hand that was online. Um, uh, we believe they are here online because sometimes people are online but not here. Yeah, that, that, that is good. So we've, 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 we've done it. We are... Uh, about seven minutes uh, over time, so this session is actually over, but we can't uh, do it without closing it. So I'm going to ask my panelists to give closing remarks, uh, because plenaries are op opening up conversations, and then in the breakaways, we answer the questions uh, in a more, more directly way. I'm gonna give them an opportunity to give the, the closing remarks and then we will then go to uh, what we came here for, which is tea, tea break and all that. <laughs> uh, are we fair? Are we okay? I think we're okay. And I'm going to start from my, 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 my left end in and, and this way. You just have a minute to close. Okay, thank don't, you, Chair. Don't answer questions, please. Okay. Yeah. Well, I am going to answer questions, um, but based on the research and universities, I think there is a fundamental problem with the structure. In many instances, universities do operate as an ivory tower. And if we look at an 86% adult literacy rate in South Africa, and that is a functional literacy rate, we should consider how the research products we produce are packaged in a manner that it can be distributed to citizens on various levels. And that can also then be achieved by collaboration with government and civil society organizations that do function on a grassroots level. And this links with active citizenry. I think part of the problem is that majority of citizens feel disempowered. And this is because you only go to the voting station every five years for national and provincial elections. And then every year or two years after that, you go for the local government elections and you tick a box. Now, as rightly indicated on electoral reform, the organization on doing tax abuse is contributing to this where we want to have a constituency-based system that citizens can directly represent or elect representatives from their constituencies. That is a top-down approach. A bottom-up approach then is to give citizens an opportunity to become active within their local community organizations. Now, Alto also has an initiative known as the um, Citizen Action Network, and it looks at the development of LCOs being connected to their municipalities, the local community organizations, where they can directly engage with their representatives, with people in the community to report and engage on issues. Hey, this thing is making noise. <laughs> So Thank we you. should consider bottom-up and top-down approaches. Hey, timers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Arita. Sorry for outing you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for all the questions. Siabulela Nelson, uh, the guy from National Treasury. Maybe we need to engage after this during the tea, tea time. But maybe just to touch base at a high level, the Auditor General has come up with a new strategy. It's called a Culture Shift 2030. And it seeks to uh, bring closer the audit outcomes to the lived realities of the citizens on the ground, number one. And it will achieve that through three critical pillars. One, we want to shift away from just issuing findings, audit reports, but issue insights. Insights that will ignite uh, action on the ground, that's number one. Number two, 
we want to influence slightly differently, which is why I'm excited to be part of this session today. And then number three, we want to accelerate the new powers that were bestowed upon us uh, three years ago, the material irregularity process. We do see impact already that's coming through uh, from that process, but we want to expand it to almost cover all uh, of our oddities. And then, Siabulela, thanks for that question. You know, I've taken one thing, the indicator framework that needs to be introduced to track the indicators, and we evolve, we continue to evolve and improve. So this is something I'll take back, but part and parcel of the findings, of the recommendations that we have raised is that the oversight bodies, whether the portfolio committees, the audit committees, um, need to do their job thoroughly, um, in, in terms of approving the APPs in time. And also we have found an opportunity as an office to insert ourselves in that process and perhaps approve, um, sorry not approve, be part of the audit process that approves those APPs in advance so that we I can arrest this. this problem in time. Inshallah. Uh, that that, uh, that will happen um, and also the planning processes will improve so that we don't have to submit our budget before we submit our APPs uh, so that we can plan better in government uh, but the reality is that in South Africa if you have a job for you the stakes are high the reality is that until we change uh, those material conditions even if we remove all of the unethical and illegal activities inside of government, it will be replaced by new ones. So the only thing that you can actually do in, until these material conditions change is to invest in the ethical value system uh, so that when people feel guilty, even though the institution uh, might be responsible for uh, missing a person who's on their payroll, that person should feel guilty for taking a second salary. Uh, like I feel guilty, and I'm sure you all do. I pay my e tolls until it's going to be scrapped, and then I'll be told, don't pay it anymore. But we should feel guilty about the wrong things we do. Why do we not? I'll stop there. Uh, I'll compete with the alum. <laughs> uh, the first thing to the issue raised by Prof. Master Muller, I wonder if we were to inculcate the notion of an activist scholarship where you pursue an idea to impact change than a career scholarship where you write because funds were available because you needed the next promotion. Because very often, if you are an activist, you'll follow through and escort your ideas, canvas them. The second one of politicians using history, I raised it in the recent presentation where I was talking about the message and the messenger saying that very often people who want to be put first in the queue say we were in exile, we were in prison as if people were presented as mercenaries who say I'll fight for you then you'll pay me later. The reality is that you can't take a person because they were in Morokoro conference and say, I want to make them a minister who will lead the fourth industrial revolution. Because that's using a rear view mirror to direct a traffic instead of using a windscreen. Imagination about future can be more impactful at times than experience. And lastly, the issue of social facilitation, when I chaired the IDT to those from Treasury, 
Not a single school, hospital, or courts were banned because we put aside money for community social facilitation where we engaged the community first before we started any construction project. But in our days, vandalism, because people just find bricks being brought in, they do not know what is happening and so forth. I hope that we consider reversing the decision not to fund the social facilitation. With that church bell, I think I would have gone to <laughs> yes, the next thanks. one. The, the, the last one on religion. I it's think it's a that. good point, but at the same time, trust in religion at times might not necessarily be an indication of the trust. When people face crisis and helplessness, they might look for salvation and divine intervention. Hence, they look everywhere else, but some of the churches themselves are a crime scene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated to the speakers. In the end, we had 13 minutes for each speakers in the end. And then we had uh, 14 questions asked, which is good. And then there were nine comments made, so the conversation opened up. And in the end, you came out a little wiser uh, in order to relearn. Um, um, the, the rest of the process of relearning will happen during tea time, which is taking place where it was, the, the other side. Uh, we will not take long there. Can we take 10 minutes and come back to the breakaway sessions, B1, B2, B3? At this point, the... The, the, the hosts are going to give them something to them to declare at work, and then there will be some picture taking, and I will not be involved. Thank you very much for listening. Somehow I'm included. Uh, James, can you send your memory stick down? Got presentations. I can copy it as well. <laughs> Anyone that they have presentations for B1, please see us now. Presentations for B1.
And so oh yeah. summer, see, sus. Yes, 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 yes. Can you hear me? My check. Checking, checking mic. Sound systems, the C.
Hi everyone. Hi everyone. So this is B1. This is B1 breakaway. So please make sure that this is the right breakaway that you want to to attend. So good morning uh, once more again. Uh, let's settle down. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, this is a breakaway session, uh, B1. Uh, my name is Mlo Ndivilagazi. Uh, I'm with the University of KwaZulu Natal Graduate School of Business and Leadership. So I welcome you all here. Uh, as we uh, went through this morning, the theme is state capture, ethics, and government performance. I think that we've all listened to the speakers this morning, and now it is time for us to get the breakaway sessions. Uh, and hear what our presenters uh, will speak to us about. So what will happen is we will give our speakers 15 minutes each. Uh, I will time them 15 minutes and then they will all present uh, following each other. And then afterwards we will have uh, another 15 minutes because we have an hour, we'll have another 15 minutes for uh, questions and answers as well as comments. So, thank you, thank you very much. Um, the first speaker uh, that we have is Katyn Hasbinei Vumbunu, who will be talking to us about corruption, accountability, and service delivery in South Africa, in South African municipalities reflecting on trends and patterns in KZN province 2014 to 2021. So, he's not here. Okay, so we will then uh, go to Vusi Kumbi and Keobaka Tolo, uh, who will be talking to us about the importance of accountability in a developmental state, analyzing the impact of the electoral system in the direction of parliamentary oversight. So take it away, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, good, good. It's still five minutes before morning ends, so good morning. 
And my name is Skiawa Katsolo. I am co-authoring this paper with my colleague here, Vusi Gumbi, and we're from the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation under the University of uh, Johannesburg. I would like to thank the university and also the government for uh, making this uh, presentation and also conference to interact with everyone. And thank you for being here, as you could have been anywhere in the in the, in the breakaway sessions. So our topic is the importance of accountability in a developmental state, analyzing the impact of the electoral system in the dereliction of parliamentary oversight. And with, with that, I would just like to start with the, the background and not really dwell in too much on what the NDP and what accountability is based on what we had in the plenary sessions. And just note that the NDP was uh, spawned out of appreciation that a lot of socioeconomic conditions, particularly poverty and inequality that the NDP specifies on, needed to be redressed for the country to progress from its complex uh, past of colonial era and apartheid itself. And when we look at chapter 13, it specifically states that the NDP needs to play a transformative and developmental role in this complex past. And compounded with the democratic institutions, such as the parliament and the office of the public protector, the NDP requires a stern and rigorous political willingness, accountability and oversight so that its goals can be reached. And that these socioeconomic issues need to be addressed by 2030, if not minimized. And that is also substantiated by the Constitution under Section 55, subsection 2, where it talks about the National Assembly in, in Parliament must provide for mechanisms to ensure that all executive organs of the state need to be accounted for and need to maintain oversight of the exercise of national executive authority, including the implementation of legislation any and any organ of the state. And as we have seen 10 years into the, the implementation of the NDP, there has been a lack of accountability. And that lack of accountability, as Roger Southall also states, he says that the lack of accountability results in the arrogance of power, where the ANC has, has proven to be notorious for. But in that, in that line, I was discussing with my co-author that the, 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 the line is not only the ANC, but the ANC is spoken of because it is the ruling party, but the problem has been in the system. And with that, our problem statement has been that despite what appears to be a perfectly designed political system, there appears to be a problem of accountability. And the premise is that accountability is inextricably linked to a developmental state. That goes to state that we cannot have a development, developmental and capable state without accountability at the core. Also, as Prof. Figeni has stated that he wished that it could have been the first chapter because everything that comes out of the NDP itself is founded by that. So it then draws us to conceptualize what accountability is and what the NDP says about that. And to start on what the NDP states about accountability, it states that the government needs to provide a greater and more consistent delegation supported by systems of support and oversight. Make it easier for citizens to hold public servants and politicians accountable, particularly for the quality of service delivery, and ensure effective oversight of government through parliamentary processes. There are many different uh, accountability systems and mechanisms that I just spoke of, but just to focus on the one that South Africa uses since 1994, the supervisory accountability, which is the requirement and representative democracies that executives answer to legislatures for their actions and inactions. And looking at the name and the, the, the title of the chapter 13, where it builds, or where it states, sorry, building a capable and developmental state, it shows just how much accountability is needed as it is subsection to that. And to pass over now to my co-supervisor, he will talk more about the case studies into proving how the electoral system actually is at the basis of 
the proportional representation is at the basis of this accountability lacking in itself, whereas we know that we vote for the parties and the parties will choose their members and in that it lacks accountability. So if we see, may you just come and continue, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I should start by saying I said no mkhozo. Or maybe because I'm in KZ and Octula. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, thank you uh, to my colleague for laying the foundation. Um, as you can see on the screen, it says um, you are on the ANC list, you are in parliament, you are expected to respect the constitution, but you're not a free rider. You are not on a free range when, where you can do as you like. This was ANC President um, Sal Ramaphosa at the State Capture Commission. This statement succinctly explains and summarizes the nature of the electoral system um, and its role in ensuring that we have a parliament that um, does not perform effective and efficient oversight. So with, without an effective parliament, uh, that can perform um, oversight. Development becomes a pipeline dream. So uh, since um, 10 years uh, of the NDP, there have been many instances where parliament has been found wanting. But in this case, there are two case studies that actually stand out, well documented in media and other platforms alike. It is the infamous Nkandla projects and the second one is the parliamentary inquiry into ESCOM. Starting with the Nkandla project, this was the biggest scandal facing the, the fourth parliament since the democratic dispensation, where uh, the money that was initially budgeted to 27 million, it ballooned to over 200 million. And because these upgrades were done at the then president's house, these, the flouting of the rules, the flouting of the constitution was thought to be, ne never to be questioned rather. The, 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 the leadership of the ANC and as, as the majority in government knew that there were discrepancies involved in Kandla, amongst others, especially for the purposes of this paper, is that critical service delivery programs were shelved so that money can be directed into the Ngandla, uh, into the Ngandla project. So the ministers involved um, and the president himself in tacitly accepting these upgrades showed that the executive code of ethics was violated. It was clear the public protector really spelled it out. And something then happened with the Ngandla where uh, the then speak of parliament, a dignified man who sought to lead parliament beyond party lines, Max Sulu decided to form an ad hoc committee to investigate this matter. That was towards the latter stages of 2014 and just before the elections. And if I stand to be corrected, I think Max Sulu on the 2012 elective conference in Mangaung, he was, I think, on the ANC, NEC list, he was, I think, number 13 or number 14, somewhere there. So this is important because we generally know in the ANC, on the NEC, your position determines where you are likely to be deployed. So Mexi Sulu was a senior ANC member, and simply because he had taken the decision to uh, establish an ad hoc committee, when after the 2014 elections, he was reduced to a backbencher, not a deputy minister. This is a person who was a speaker in the previous parliament, and that became a message to any other member of the ANC to say, you dare so the constitution will render you into political obscurity. And in what seemed like a deja vu, the, the allegations into ESCOM, that then became the birth of what we call now the State Capture Commission of Inquiry, where the opposition said the allegations are around ESCOM. Let's form an ad hoc committee to investigate what is actually happening. But then, at first, the ruling party uh, refused. But then again, when they changed the chairperson of the portfolio committee into public enterprises, uh, at the time, the person who then succeeded to Ms. Elizabeth Duba was Zuki Sarantu. She then took a bold decision to say, okay, we're going to form an inquiry into ESCOM. That was 2017. 
And what's significant is that this was also a year after the Constitutional Court had handed down a historic ruling to say Parliament had failed in Nganda. A year later, then Zugisa says, we then have to investigate ESCOM. Same thing happened to her. 2019 elections, she was not on the ANC list. So this is a pattern that we see unfolding where Parliament cannot exercise its oversight function. And it is largely because of the electoral system that we use. And I think on the basis of clarity, it's also important to let you know that this current electoral system, it was never meant to be a long-term plan. It was never meant to be used beyond 1999. That's why 2002, President Tabo established an electoral task team that was going to look into a feasibility, an electoral system that can ensure that on one hand, we have uh, the, the broad demographics of the population because why a rainbow nation and we don't want to feel like, we don't want any other groups to feel like they're being alienated, they're represented in parliament. On the other hand, we make sure that there's accountability and they suggested a, a mixed system where out of the 400 seats of parliament, you would have around 300 MPs who are directly coming from the constituencies. And then the 100 remaining are on the party's proportional list because although the PR system has its own flaws, it was significantly chosen to ensure that the broad demographics of the population are represented, especially considering that everyone must feel like they're playing a role in the, 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 the political uh, direction that um, the party takes. So this is also, am I on time, Chair? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so this is particularly important because um, the, it's a well-timed topic. You would recall 11 June uh, 2020, the Concord then uh, uh, um, delivers a ruling that the Concord delivers a ruling that um, the electoral system must be amended to allow individual candidates to run for office. A few weeks back, Parliament voted for an uh, electoral amendment. But now civil society is complaining to say, but the rules of this electoral reform that has been vo uh, uh, voted for in Parliament actually make it difficult for indiv individual candidates to run to be members of Parliament. And this is a reflection of political parties who understand that should it be easy for individual candidates to run for, to be members of Parliament, power will be taken away from them because people are likely to elect the people they know in proximity. If you go now in South Africa and ask the men on the ground, which member of parliament do you know? They won't answer you. Because in the type of electoral system that we have, party politics trump the state. President Zuma was only a villain once he had lost power in the ANC. The ANC only had the guts to call him out once he had lost power. And the same thing is happening right now, where uh, whether or not the current president is held accountable will be determined by internal party politics rather than due process. So then you will find a situation where after the current president has stepped aside, there's this sudden awakening from ANC members where to say, yeah, but he was wrong with Palapala. Whereas they've known all along. So it's the same thing. So unless we change the electoral system, accountability will be a pipeline dream. And for as long as accountability is a pipeline dream, we can never achieve a developmental state. It's a well-timed topic, and uh, my colleague and I are grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vosi and uh, Keobaka. Um, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you were exactly on 15 minutes, so you did very well for time. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I think that I, these are thought-provoking um, comments uh, or, or on the paper because we know that uh, state capture happened because of, you know, parliamentary oversight. Uh, we know that there's also a lot of things that are happening, not just in terms of corruption or any other sort of... Uh, you know, maladministration, 
but you know it happens everywhere with municipalities with the uh, provinces so it's not just uh, the national government uh, that needs a, a parliamentary oversight so this is really this is really good because it affects the uh, government performance because if you do not have oversight then you know you don't have a reason to 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 work hard for your constituency or, or for the public so thank you so much uh, for that i will now call on uh, joey krishnan uh, as well as professor moki suban uh, to to present Thank you, Chair, for this minute indulgence. Greetings, everyone. I have a disclaimer. I did not sit on the stage because I don't want to steal the thunder from Joey. This is a very interesting study that was conducted in empirical research on financial um, governance in local government. We are at a very challenging space right now when it comes to audit committees and their accountability. And I'm pleased to say and very proud to say that the findings of this study will be implemented in KZN at this point in time. With that introduction, I want to welcome Joey to the podium. And this is based on a very successful study that she has conducted for her doctorate. So join me in congratulating her. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Subban. Um, yeah, and for the guidance and uh, burning the midnight oil over many, many moons. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity. Dr. Vilakazi, um, thank you. Uh, as Professor has said, it talks about audit committees in local government. Uh, we're talking about state capture. Really, local government is the sphere of government closest to the people. If local government fails, government fails. They don't care whether the province is responsible for education or health it's local government that will fail. So I won't go into that detail, but in relation to the study, audit committees, um, and I see my colleague from National Treasury here, so I'm glad you're here. You can take some of this back and we can extend it nationally as well. But audit committees are, are a very important institutional structure to promote accountability in local government. They are an independent uh, committee that is brought in to provide assurance to uh, municipal councils and to management on the state of their, their finances. So a very, very strong um, structure that enables us to ensure good governance in municipalities. And of course, if they are effective in exercising oversight and we can then assure that the funding is actually going towards service delivery, we will know that our citizens are benefiting from what we're doing in local government. So um, I think you're familiar with Chapter 7 of the Constitution establishing local government and really the developmental nature of local government and the goals um, that have been set. And one of those objects of local government specifically defined is the fact that local government has to be accountable and democratic. And, you know, with all that has been said this morning, are we in a position to say today that our local government is accountable? and is democratic. I see a lot of heads shaking. So the other thing that was discussed this morning was the issue of the value system. And we all know section 195 of the Constitution, right? Or we know that it's there. But we don't know every single element of section 195 of the Constitution. And someone this morning said, we don't have a common ethical code. But that's it. We're in the business of serving our citizens. And we've set our business ethics in the Constitution. So what more do we need? Why are we not living it? That's perhaps the question we need to ask ourselves. And of course, that translates to local government in terms of Section 50 of the Municipal Systems Act, right? Because we don't have a single public service. So if you say public servants, they might think, no, it's not them. It's just province and national. And then, of course, we, we are required to develop policies and we have to have a governing board 
that oversees the implement or development and implementation of these policies. And in local government, that governing board is the municipal council itself, elected through an electoral system, electoral system that may or may not be flawed, but nonetheless, they are the governing board. Um, and the audit committee then has a critical role of monitoring the implementation of the policies that this governing board develops um, for, for the administration to deal with. I think you're familiar with the, the prescripts of the National Development Plan and in KZN we have the Provincial Growth and Development Strategy that also is, uh, sets a, a very good program of action. But the question of the impact that we're making as opposed to the outputs uh, indicators that we are measuring becomes questionable. So what then are these audit committees also looking at and contributing in terms of that broader context? The one area that when we talk governance, we perhaps place lesser emphasis on as government is the code of corporate governance, which we all know is applicable to all spheres of government, is applicable to public private sector, governmental, non-governmental organizations, it's applicable to everybody. But we've taken this code and we've expanded on it within our legislative framework. So we've taken certain components, we've put it in the code of conduct for counselors and the code of conduct for officials. We've built it into our strategy documents, our Bartopele principles, talk to these issues that emanate from the King for Code. And here we're talking about capable, uh, stable administrations, um, which are necessary to actually ensure that we deliver services. So I won't go through the detail of this, but core to King 4 uh, principles is leadership, ethics and accountability, um, and in particular, we're talking about driving success of government through these principles. Um, as indicated by the professor, the study is based on, on, on three broad um, uh, theor theoretical perspectives. The first is agency theory, obviously, okay, and it's talking about the information asymmetries between uh, management and, and the owners of a business. In this context, we're talking about what would be the administrative senior management, a municipal council, and you have an audit committee sitting here on the side who's supposed to also work within that framework of information flows that happens in a municipality. Stewardship theory, obviously, um, you have the owners as, uh, that appoint stewards for their business. And here we're seeing that municipal councils um, and the management should be sharing the same goals in a municipality. And the question is, does that happen? To some degree, we can say, yes, it does. When you see the mass exodus of senior management if the party changes, as we've seen in KZN. You know, so, so you want somebody who has the same goals, holds the same values, have the same objectives as you. And so that to some degree perhaps does happen. And then institutionalization, we, we've got legislation that forces us to comply with all the tenets that, and prescripts that are there. So the role of audit committees, the responsibilities of everybody is defined, and we've got all the structures, they are there. So we've institutionalized it, and yet we fail. So those are some of the things that, um, that we looked at. And what we've, we've concluded is that compliance um, is really driven by the rules and the processes, and it is not sufficient for good governance. I've always said in KZN, 100% compliance is the minimum. You don't get a pat on the back for that. That's what you're expected to do, okay? What do we do to take it beyond mere compliance and mere, beyond just a tick box of what is uh, to be done or not to be done? Um, there has to be structured and credible behavioral systems that draw people to effective governance. We've got to change the culture. We've got to change, and the culture starts with us, individually, collectively, organizationally, and that's the only way we're going to make the difference. And in as far as South Africa is concerned, our need for compliance clearly outweighs the behavioral change that is required. We're all so busy ticking the box and, do, and making sure we comply for the AG 
and, and National Treasury and COGTA and somebody else in local government that we're not actually really getting on with giving our hearts to the job that we're required to do. So there's been a number of gaps identified. There has been little research on, on performance audits in local government. Um, you know, there's gaps in the way people understand what audit committees are meant to be doing. Are they there as an oversight body? Are they there an, as an advisory body? And those two hold fundamental different uh, constructs for the work that they will do. Um, you know, as part of the study, we'd asked all the respondents, what is the income of your municipality? And I, I think probably 5% actually knew what the income of the municipality was. And you ask yourself, where is the diligence? Where is the fiduciary duty of these individuals that have been appointed to perform these tasks? And they, they in, included speakers and mayors and municipal managers and senior management, accounting officers, CFOs, audit committee chairpersons, members, impact chairpersons, councillors, and you don't know what the income of your municipality is. It's the most fundamental piece of information you should have within the context of local financial governance. So that is some, those are some of the challenges that, um, that we found, and I, I won't read through every single one of them. Safe to say that we really need to get to a point where municipal councils who are ultimately accountable to citizens and stakeholders are actually accountable and effective. So in terms of the audit committee itself, we looked at specifically attribute knowledge and skills of audit committee members. Um, we identified sort of 16 um, constructs and then, and then we applied fact analysis and then we we were able to draw on, on that. Um, and the things that came out is that, as far as the attributes are concerned, everybody says they must be ethical. And yet this morning we say we don't have a common view of what ethical should be. But we do have a gut feeling of what, right, what is right and wrong. Everybody knows what is right and wrong. So that should drive us. Um, they should have experience in local government or in the public sector. Um, and local government is highly specialized, it's highly complex, it's highly legislated. We can't take a CA from a private sector company and make them a CFO and believe that they will, they will actually succeed. You might actually just set them up for failure. You know? So the local government environment is highly specialized. So that kind of context is very important. Professionalism, we know what that is, right? Being forthright, okay? at the expense of wanting to have bodyguards, you know? That's, that's the trade-offs, and, and those are the risks. But those are the kinds of qualities that people were saying are required of these members who serve on audit committees. They have to be open and honest, and they have to be experts in the field. So how do you test this? You go for an interview, how do you test these things from any candidate? whether it is for to serve as a member of an audit committee or for a managerial position or anything else in government. How do you actually test this? And we spoke about this morning, um, you know, some kinds of, of um, testing that can be done around integrity and lifestyle audits and all of those kinds of things, and they're being introduced. Um, as far as knowledge, obviously one would expect local government, finance, auditing, uh, but there are other areas that are required, areas of engineering. I mean, infrastructure is an, a field in itself. Um, and you have people who don't have any technical knowledge taking decisions. And then legal and others. So some of the things that were said is that experience is lacking. Um, the audit committee um, should comprise of professionals with other expertise. And strong management and a strong internal audit are, are important. Uh, for, for a well-oiled administrative machinery. Um, the characteristics, I think they, they echo some of the, the issues that we've highlighted in terms of the knowledge, skills, and attributes. The composition was important. What's important is that audit committees are generally appointed by the municipal manager. And at the same time, they must exercise oversight over the administration. Right? So that's a dilemma already uh, that needs to be resolved. And um, I think really what we're saying is we've got to start living the values. 
that are enshrined in the Constitution. We've got to make sure that the ethical values and principles influenced by organizational culture are expressed in the codes and in, uh, in the codes of ethics, and that they are then measured in terms of how are we doing based on our ethical codes of, uh, and, and conduct. Um, and then, you know, all of the other good governance tools, processes, and, and structures need to be in place to actually ensure that we are transparent and we are, we are living these, uh, these values. So we need to have effective cooperation and alignment. We need to make sure there's sufficient monitoring and evaluation. Um, and we cannot detract from, from the governance reforms. Um, we need training on ethics. If we don't have a common understanding, we need training on ethics and governance in particular. Um, and what we've developed out of the study is a self-evaluation framework for audit committees. At the moment, there's a tick list. We comply with Section 166 of the MFMA. But this goes beyond that. The first two, the charter and the functions, deal with the compliance issues. Beyond that, it's about the relationship within the local financial governance framework where the audit committee has to engage with external audit, they have to engage with internal audit, they have to engage with management, municipal public accounts committees, councils, and ultimately they themselves have to have uh, a view of their own uh, ethical conduct and, and accountability. And so within that system, one needs to look at it because you can have a brilliant audit committee that will fail dismally if the administration doesn't do what it's supposed to do, or if the council doesn't do what it is supposed to do, and it needs to therefore be seen within the context of local financial governance. And we hope that through the study we can shed light on, on this macro perspective, um, but also draw on specific areas that we, that we can introduce to change both legislation, policy frameworks, um, and systems to be able to enhance local government through audit committees. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Uh, I'll let you continue because uh, we don't have great in, so I thought maybe I should give you one more minute so that uh, you can conclude. So thank you very much uh, uh, for, for that a very good presentation. Um, I think that it speaks to, you know, uh, when you talk about tick, tick box exercise, it, it, it speaks to really what we should be about as, as uh, you know, people in the public service. That it's not just being, you know, waking up, going to work, drawing a salary every month. South Africa is not a developed country, so we are not maintaining what is already happening. We are, we, we are supposed to be change agents. So every day you wake up, you go to work, there is something that you must do to advance the developmental state, which means that there has to be quantifiable you know, measures to say that this is what we are doing. These are the targets that we, we, we are setting for ourselves. It's not just waking up and maintaining what is already there. We are not maintaining anything here. If you could maintain what is happening, then you know, come 10 years from now, we'll still be in the same position. So we really need to, to you know, be activists uh, in our approach. So thank you so much uh, for that presentation and, and uh, thank you also to, to Vosi and as well as Geobaga. So I'll open uh, for, for questions and comments. Uh, please keep it brief. Uh, you know, we, we still have time because uh, uh, we didn't have Katie, so, but keep it brief so that, you know, more people can engage uh, with us. So I'll just open for, for comments and answers. Yes, we'll start on that side, yes. Thank you very much, Selma Kukumu speaking. And I think congratulations are due, Joey. I'm very well done, I'm proud of you and what you've achieved. I would just like to check with you, you mentioned the self-evaluation questionnaire, which I'm, which I'm really interested in. 
Were you able to apply that in audit committees in KZN? And what was the reaction or the response, first of all, by the people that actually completed the questionnaire, but also can you see change in the audit committees after you applied the questionnaire? Thank you. Hey, we'll move right along. Thank you uh, to the two gentlemen and the lady. I've got just two comments. The, the two comments for to both is, did you maybe went uh, to the lady, you are studied, did you go and observe the audit committees when they are uh, <laughs> um, having an um, engagement with the with department and what was your observation? The other one, it, it, it would have been nice if you, you had indicated, I did not see it, Woody. As of now, does this committee people that are nominated to be committee of, or, you know, audit committees, do have got the relevant, um, relevant um, qualification so that we, we know how to move, how to move forward? Secondly, to the two gentlemen, um, for me, the, 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 I think also we, we should have heard, although we know what he, to be a member of parliament, you don't need any, any um, re, there is no requirement. You must just be a member of this party, D, A, B, C, D, then you can be a member of the party. It, it would have been nice to check how do the, the parties in parliament nominate people to be uh, uh, members of portfolio committees uh, and whatever, so that I what informs me to be a, 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 a member of a portfolio committee that is responsible for education and whatever, that will tell us why maybe uh, equality of oversight and accountability is not there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair, mine is just a comment, in particular the second speaker. Um, this is not a political gathering. Um, it's a government-sponsored event, and I would advise him to refrain from making political statement. Because I'm starting to think this um, gathering is more anti gnostic or anti-ANC or anti-government. We are here, let's find solution on, on our problems. We are public servants. We create problems, and let's find solution to those problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Priya from Department of Health. Um, and this is, is a general question, perhaps, to um, the, all the panelists. Uh, given that we are seeing that uh, more and more there are austerity measures being implemented across all state departments, and particular uh, our service delivery departments, um, it's paradoxical also, like it was mentioned earlier, that this is beginning to affect and hurt the 80% of us public servants who, as Prof. Fikeni put it, are not a flawed character. Because we must now face the cyclical condition where uh, working conditions are getting poorer, uh, people um, you know, are not appreciating coming to work environments anymore. There's so much a deterioration around the infrastructure of where we work and so on and so forth which is just leading to more depression, more de despondency, more disengagement. So how do we begin to move away from being that scholar activist, as he referred to, to a proper activist for proper public service? That's my first part. The second one was about what Mr. Vusi Gumbi said, and I just maybe ask, how do we then move away from this, what I would term, animal farm ethics, because clearly it's hurting all of us. Thank you. Uh, we'll just take those for now and uh, allow the panel to respond. 
Vosi, do you want to? Yes, yes, you can start. Okay, um, okay, my colleague will take another one, so I'd just like to respond. The first one, uh, the ANC is the ruling party, so we cannot hold them to the same standard as opposition. Another thing is that when we look at the election of parliament, we don't have a coalition in, in, in parliament. We have one ruling party, and then we have to take it from there. So it is not an anti-ANC sentiment. We have to go back to the books and check what happened, what has caused the dereliction of parliament. So how do we separate the failure of parliament to perform oversight to the current party that is in power? And another thing, this is not directed at the ANC. So it, what we are saying is that even if the EFF was in power, the same thing would happen. He did say at the beginning that the party is not the problem. The problem is the system. He did mention it. So we cannot talk about the DA because it is not majority in government, in parliament, neither can we talk about the EFF. But what I'm saying is that how do we separate the dereliction of parliamentary oversight to the ruling part of the majority part in government? We can't. Uh, thank you so much. I will, if I may, if I may just to comment a bit on, on, on what Vusi has also stated about, to mention that the ruling party in 2012 was the one that also came up with the NDP. And the case studies that we use are used in line with the objectives of what the NDP has said and what the politics have been in the past 10 years to, 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 to see if they have been accountable or not based on chapter 13. And just to get back to that comment about how uh, to check how political parties select their members and also how they would elect them into different portfolio committees, we, we, we do acknowledge and I have noted that we will just put it in the paper and also in, in, in our paper and also in the chapter 13 it does state that the members need to, the members of government, government officials need to be people who have experience and be people who are qualified for the job and that is why it's so important for them to, 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 to have systems that will support them and develop skills for the long term in order for it to happen, and the long term in this case being 2030. Thank you. Should I just respond? Oh, okay, sorry, I, I realized I forgot to answer the lady's question there about Animal Farm. Um, in, in, in 1999, um, outgoing state president, Nelson Mandela said, in the final sitting of parliament, and I quote, we need to re-examine, uh, we need to examine whether we need to change the electoral system so as to improve our interaction as public representatives with the voters. And there have been three panels. It was the 2002, three electoral task team report. It was the 2009 independent uh, panel into the uh, um, independent assessment panel into parliament. It was the 2017 Mutlante panel, so three that have specifically said, in order to improve South Africa, because you see, why I believe that the electoral system is the first point of departure, is that everything rises and falls on leadership. We address the electoral system, it is, is then it becomes a ripple effect on all of these other ones. So we have three panels whose findings are the same. And then we have political parties who a few weeks ago vote to amend the electoral system, but with conditions that make it difficult. Because why? Like I said, it is a reflection of parties who understand that their current electoral system advantages them. So, and I never, all, all of them, I think the only party that supported, I think, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, the majority uh, um, uh, uh, voted for that uh, electoral system. But if you look into those conditions, it makes it difficult even for independent candidates to run because the parties know that if they make it easy, the power will be away from them. So that's why I'm saying that everything rises and falls on leadership. Thank you. Thanks, um, Chair. Um, I think just to add on, on what um, Vusi has said, we've seen in KZN that at the moment we have 21 coalition governments in, in our municipalities. We've got 54 municipalities. 21 of which are now being led by coalition uh, councils. And the independents 
are actually the, the, the kingpins, if you may say so. You know, they are negotiating and bargaining and they are calling the shots. Uh, and they sometimes change from one party to another, one of the major parties to another, etc., etc. But it is causing chaos. So, I mean, those are some of the things that, that the converse of making it easier for independence, independence to participate, um, will, have, will have that kind of effect. So, I, I thought I'd just share that with you from, from my own experience. Um, Selma, we, we haven't really applied the full um, uh, framework as yet. Uh, we'll do so in the new year. We will no doubt pilot it in KZN, and you know KZN will share it with you. Um, and I have no doubt that it will benefit us uh, because even in assessing the effectiveness of audit committees as we have been doing, which was predominantly compliance-based, and we added one or two elements to it, we have seen improvement in their performance. So, so I have no doubt that we can deepen the uh, effectiveness of audit committees and, and the participation of members if we, if we actually implement it. Um, I think in terms of the engagement between audit committees and uh, at, at a municipal level, um, I have observed them, but not as part of the study, not part of the methodology of the study. I've observed them in my, in my normal work sphere. But having engaged through the study with participants or respondents that participate in audit committees, be they COGTA members or the AG's office uh, or municipal administrations or internal audit uh, uh, and even external audit. So the respondents covered uh, was from that spectrum as well as councillors. The, the general feeling is that the majority of the audit committees are there for compliance. They do not have sufficient time to interrogate the work that they are required to do because they are meant to meet a minimum of four times a year. Their pay is determined by National Treasury and it is insufficient to get them to really do what it is they are meant to do. So those are some of the shortcomings in terms of ensuring that there is a level of commitment from audit committees or that the, the, it, the environment is conducive to them doing the best that they absolutely can. Um, there are some who are just not diligent. There are some who attend meetings that will not read meeting documents in advance. You know, and, and those are the kinds of things that we, we, sh we appoint them. We, if we are assessing their performance and evaluating the performance as we should be doing on an, on an annual basis, then we can actually get rid of them. But we're not doing that. Because they, they, even though the, the standards call for self-evaluation uh, and an evaluation by the Municipal Council of the Audit Committee, it's only on the compliance. It's not that deeper uh, level of analysis. And, and the study then proposes um, further dimensions against which you can actually assess them. Um, the relevance of qualifications, there's a bias. The study has shown that there's a bias towards appointing audit committee members who either have a finance or an audit qualification. That's it. It's seen as a financial, um, local government finance institution. Um, but what we're saying here uh, through, through the study is that we need legal, we need performance management experts, we need technical experts, engineers sometimes, because the audit committee sometimes serves as the performance audit committee, and it's then got to also check whether there has been value for money on infrastructure projects, whether those projects are actually delivered as they should be. So it requires a little bit more in terms of the, the mix of skills necessary uh, for audit committees. And they can co-opt uh, other members, but I don't think there's money to do that. So that's an area, and some are saying definitely not. That's an area we need to look at. If we don't invest in government, in governance, we don't invest in ethical behavior, or ethical conduct, and accountability. If we don't invest in making sure that that happens, then we're not going to be successful. And then I think just lastly a comment from, I mean, the lady questioned the austerity measures, 
um, and you got to animal farm at the end, but I think the gist of it was, you know, we're trying to be prudent, we're trying to introduce austerity measures, um, and yet the, the working environment is, is suffering. So here's the thing, um, you know, we, we firstly, we, we've got to unlearn <laughs> from this morning. We've got to unlearn some of the things we learned. So the luxuries of having a fancy office and, uh, you know, all these other things. Maybe we need to unlearn that because we're servants of the people. That's the first thing. Maybe we should get by with the bare minimum. That, I think, is the first thing. And that's, the, that's what we need to have is the, the kind of standard that says, you know, this is what needs to happen. Um, in terms of austerity, we cut budgets, but are we cutting the right things? You know, we, we may cut on a project but we may still have a, a mayor or somebody, another councillor or even a municipal manager who's got 10 bodyguards and the law only allows you two, you know? Um, so where do you cut? And I sat in one municipal council uh, to try and deal with cost containment and in two sittings with the administration and the council, we, we cut 50 million rand for the year. We found 50 million. One of the things we said is, take the security uh, personnel and make sure it's compliant with the law. So you saved money. Then you are having, I mean, it was something so ridiculous, like having a person, an armed, an armed guard with a rifle to guard the library. And I sat there and I said, is that the grade of God that you need to guard the library? I mean, really, who is going to break into a library in the first place? You know, it doesn't even have computers or internet or anything. So who's going to break into the library? You know, and really, the children run the, around freely there. What is the risk? But obviously, with state capture, you know that certain security companies are getting extra work. The higher the grade of the guard, the more money you're paying out, and so on and so on. So these are some of the things I think we need to, to look at. And when we talk about state capture, let's just all be sober mm -hmm. and do what we have to do. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Suban. Wanted want to, to, to add something there. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Thank you to the colleague from the Department of Health on the austerity uh, measures, and I think that's a very important comment, particularly in the context of where we are right now in the country. Yes, of course, austerity measures are painful. They are affecting the world over. We have a very skewed income and wealth distribution in our country, and we have to really look at, whilst we're wanting to have these cost containment strategies, as Joey mentioned, but we also want to ensure that human dignity and human life is respected and that we address the very skewed income and wealth distribution that we have. And we start to address the plight of the poor. So yes, it's going to be painful, the austerity measures, but it will also mean a careful balancing act so that we address uh, uh, living standards, that we raise uh, the, the poorest of the poor, that we address this huge poverty chasm that is is, is, is really scary because when we look at 2030, which is really around the corner, we talk about uh, economic growth and it's slow economic growth. And if we don't have a serious concerted strategy to address uh, the poorest of the poor on the ground, then we're not really serious about fulfilling the tenets of the Constitution. So thank you very much for that comment. Thank you, Prof. Uh, just a thought. Just the thought here, uh, if we're a country that is about, you know, monitoring each other, oversight, auditing, accountability, we're always talking about those things. What does it say about our, I would say, aggregate ethics as a country, you know, that every time we have to talk about holding each other accountable? got to monitor, or got to. So what does it say about the state of our country? It's that we really are, you know, our culture is really now about maladministration, corruption, and all these wrong things. 
because we cannot be, if we cannot hold each other accountable, even in this room, uh, then how do you expect everyone to, because this, if we say that this is the aggregate ethics of South Africa, then that means that a percentage of people even inside here have questionable ethics because we are South Africans, right? And we work for government, we work for private sector, we work everywhere, but we have questionable ethics. We have to hold each other accountable. Even at work, your, your colleague is not doing something. We've got to do something about it. Uh, at home, you, you see someone that is supposed to be at work and is taking leave every other day. Like, we've got to question these things because these things in the whole system, they slow us down as a country. We are unproductive because of, this, of these things. Because we know that, ah, okay, uh, I, I can be drunk on the road in nzo, nzo, kokin, cho, cho, and you know, all, all these things. So it's something that we really have to harness, you know, that we have to really think about that as a country, we are slipping down the, you know, the drain in terms of our ethics. So we really have to, to work hard on this. I don't know what we can do but maybe it starts there with the auditing committees and all these things. But the problem is that we, we will keep them for so long that we will know that, you know, our, you know it's, it's a job of the auditing committee that has to look at the malfeasance, look at mal maladministration. But it's actually about us as a person. Don't do it. Even if you're thinking about taking that bribe, don't do it because it will affect the next person. So I'll just uh, take on a few questions, and then there we, have, we have another question on the chats. I think that we can start on the, with the chats, uh, and then we, we will we'll bring it back to the house. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'm the spokesperson for the uh, chat group here, virtually. Uh, the first one was, is it possible to have the presentation shared? The second one, um, a good attempt was made for the. Um, a good attempt was made for the conference to be covered on TV, including newsrooms and SABC. Sorry. Uh, but, but the presenter, uh, the, the. The question raised, Chair, was that they were wondering whether it could. Uh, they were wondering if it could be shared with community radio stations to expand these valuable debates um, with local communities. And the second question that, or comment that was raised um, on this platform was to say that they support the concern raised by the latter speaker on the political statements. It was just those two things, Jim. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just add uh, the, the questions and comments from the house, and then we will uh, move. Uh, I think we, we should start on that side uh, now. Thank you, gentlemen at the back. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll follow, sir. No, thank you. No, thanks, Jefferson. Uh, for me, really, it's just a, a comment and, and a concern that um, there are some of the statements that are being made from that pl platform. I think I support the previous gentleman. We are having a very nice conversation here, a, a very civil conversation, and I think we should keep it at that. There's comments like questionable people with questionable ethics and all those things. I don't think it's fruitful for this level of engagement. You see, when you, do, you deal with issues of research, there's a certain level uh, on which you are supposed to operate, uh, even when you're dealing with issues of ethics. You know, in philosophy, there's something we call suspending your judgment. You know, one of the scholars in, who's very no, well known in, in, in justice, he talks about the veil of ignorance. Uh, you don't polarize the discussion, so that's just my advice. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Uh, it's not a question, but an input um, and something that I've been pondering about since yesterday to say one, one of the things that we need to invest on as, as government f from, uh, to, to deal with the issue of ethics is also uh, the, the issue of community mobilization, or let me put it this way, they, there's, there's, a, there's a missing profession or there's, a, there's value in investing in the profession for community development of which in this country I feel in, uh, in terms of uh, being involved in, in, in community development, I see that we, we think and somehow we don't understand the value that we can get from there. Uh, just to, to give you an example that uh, communities can be influenced to a right direction by having the right foot soldiers on the ground that speaks the, the, their language but at the same time that uh, capacitates communities to understand their rights, to understand their vision, and to be able to express their vision in a manner that uh, they develop themselves, or development comes from what you see if you go outside into, uh, and you look at that uh, 20 NDP analogy. They, one of the elements there is, talks about active citizenry. Active citizenry cannot just come by itself. We need to have people and an effort that cultivates that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving right along. Uh, we'll, we'll start here and then. Oh, OK. We'll just move like that. You'll be the last speaker, sir. Uh, th th thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I think, as I'm sitting here, I'm kind of following up with a sense uh, that people have been uncomfortable with the discussions around um, the politics, ANC, and, and, and all that. Now, I'm, I'm starting to ask myself to say, if, if that is the case, wh where are we supposed to be having this discussion? And, and maybe somewhere else, um, the, the, the difficulties that I think people are having and perhaps maybe the, the, the authors will assist. I, I'm not sure if we have po politicians here um, who are at the parliament and, and, and responsible for anything going on in terms of reshuffling or whatever the way you, you have explained it. <laughs> or, I mean, your concerns. I, I, I'm not sure whether people here, yeah. that's what they do on a daily basis. I'm not sure that's what, what and, and if they don't do that, I'm not sure how this is going to help them. Uh, in other words, I'm saying we're having discussions with the wrong people. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, here, in the middle, here, and then, yeah. Thank you, Chen. Thank you. Firstly, I want to put a disclaimer. I'm not against the academics. I love them. But uh, I just want to say something along the lines of how, beside the papers that they are writing, which as public servants we don't usually see, how can they play a role, especially with what they are telling us today? Uh, we don't come together with them every time, but can they also give time to um, avail themselves, maybe in those uh, uh, departments that they see that they are influential, to come and talk and understand where the processes are. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the recommendations with the doctor, the lady doctor has put in terms of ethics and the conduct to say, perhaps I, I just want to give, to say in government, especially the public service, which is the DPSA, 
together with the School of Government and PCTA have put together a program where they are making sure that public servants are being trained in ethics. Beside the fact that the Constitution Section 195 is there in the Batupili principles, which are guiding the public servants. But again, we still see the, the, the gap in the ethical conduct. But this is a program that is continuing in the public sector. Because we're also looking at, we don't want people to just comply and say, we have done the course. But that course must mean something to them. Like uh, Professor uh, Fikeni said, it starts at home. It starts at school. It starts everywhere, at work. You need to ask yourself, I know what I'm doing is wrong. How can I change it? So I'm just saying, having put those recommendations, I'm asking myself, are you aware of what the public service has done thus far? How can we collaborate with you and maybe give some time to come and see the departments? Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey. Hello. Okay. Uh, for me, uh, it's a it's it's a it's a comment as a as a government official. You know, um, it's very tough being a public servant these days because uh, there's a lot of um, um, issues that we have to deal with. Amongst others, is the political interference. We can never deny that, colleagues. It's 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 there and it's frustrating uh, some of. Uh, uh, officials who are wanting to do the right thing. And we know that um, some of us, um, uh, we are wanting to do the right thing, but at what price? And at what cost? Because um, um, you, 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 are, you are expected um, um, in some instances, some instances to supervise or to manage people who have learned um, uh, certain behaviors and certain patterns, and then you have uh, to manage uh, such people who have been in the public service for longer. You know, have been doing a lot of things for quite a very long time, and then uh, you are subjected to that kind of um, uh, supervision. And how do you how do you uh, capacitate or educate uh, people under your supervision under your supervision to unlearn? you know, the, 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 the ethical uh, conduct or to conduct themselves, you know, ethically. And then uh, for whatever reason, you know, the issues of consequence management will kick in. And then it will be to say, um, how, do, how does one uh, supervise who got through, you know, the political office? It, it's a very frustrating uh, situation that we are, we are, we are in, and uh, at no point are we undermining uh, the studies that have been done by, uh, by our uh, researchers and scholars. But what we experience on the ground, the system is so frustrating such that, you know, um, um, in some instances it does put your life uh, at danger, and at some point it frustrates uh, uh, your career pathing, and it also frustrates your progress within the public service, and you end up being uh, demotivated because the system is so frustrating and so toxic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks so much. Um, my question is addressed, or my question is addressed to Vusi and perhaps um, his colleague. Um, Vusi, I'm not sure if you do have time, perhaps, to elaborate on the nature of the relationship between the electoral system and uh, account. Yes, I do assume that you're suggesting that a certain electoral system and. In, in my view, you're, you're advocating for a constituency-based 
electoral system and that that is amenable to greater accountability. I'm not sure if it's a simple relationship that once you have a constituency-based electoral system, then that will automatically uh, give rise to greater accountability. So perhaps you may want to take time to elaborate on the nature of that relationship. And just in line uh, with that, I'm not sure if uh, you did some comparative studies to see some of those countries where perhaps they've got a constituency-based electoral system and if that has produced greater accountability in the political system. Thanks. Yeah, I, I don't know whether uh, we, we, we can still take hands or you, you want to answer that, you know, there'll be just too many questions. And uh, yes, yes, if we still have time. So please say, uh, we'll, we'll just uh, uh, let them respond. And then if we still have time, um, we'll, we'll, we'll come back. And please start on if we, we, we will be able to share the slides with everyone. Oh, uh, there was uh, a comment there. Yes, we, we, we do think that we can uh, share the, 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 the slides. We'll just need to have the information so that we can, we can do that. And also, I think it can be in a broader sense to see if the conference in itself wouldn't have a platform where they can also regard. All right. But just to answer the, the gentle man at the back there, about the, the polarization of, of, of research, I don't think that that is the case because research in itself requires you to follow its instructions in order to come up with uh, findings that can be credible. That is, that is the, 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 the most basic thing to do in, in research to come up with uh, a credible uh, source. And in this regard, our paper was uh, substantiated and it followed a qualitative approach to achieve its objectives and it looked into perspectives of ideology philosophical and government stances. So in that regard, it is focused and focused into the science of politics and the authoritative value of who gets what, when, and how. In this regard, accountability, and we're using the chapter 13 of the NDP to see if that is achievable or not, and what has happened in the past 10 years looking into the next eight years before 2030. And with that, I'll, I'll give Vusi again to answer Prof there at the back and the other questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, I, I, I did say, I think, early in the study that um, the PR system was and it's still important because South Africa is still in the process of nation building, reconciliation, and unity. Um, so there's no one. Um, single electoral system that is the answer. So what we're proposing is that a mixed electoral system where you have MPs who are coming from constituencies and MPs who are coming from um, political party uh, lists. That ensures that on one hand we have MPs who are in close proximity with the people on the ground. And on the other, we have MPs who represent the demographics of the country. Because what you find often the case with the constituency-based system is that it causes a lot of lost votes. Because in a constituency-based system, it's me and Kaobaka. Uh, the, whoever is the winner between us goes to parliament. So you might find in a situation like that where parliament is filled with maybe 90% 90% of the MPs are from a particular country, a particular party, whereas the votes on the ground, you'd find that 40% are from party B. So with the PR system, there are no lost votes, you know, and that is the advantage of the current system. To say a party, a small party, a niche party can get 40, 40 um, 50,000 votes and get a member in parliament. But with a constituency-based system, that's not the case. It's winner takes all. So that's why we're saying that we're advocating for a mixed a electoral system because um, if you look into local government and you look into in, uh, uh, the five years between local government and the number of by-elections that we have, some of these by-elections are because the committee will say, no, we don't want this chap anymore. He's no longer saving our interests. That then is a reflection of the electorate. That is the refle a reflection of a relationship between the electorate 
and the people that they elect. Something that we don't see in national parliament. We have not done a comparative analysis, but this is something that obviously we'll go back to the Turin board and see uh, you know, whether or not it's feasible. I know that the United Kingdom uh, has the type of system that I'm talking about, uh, but it will be obviously interesting to see whether or not there's been that level of accountability. Obviously looking at how Boris Johnson stepped out and the fact that uh, members of parliament and ministers in, in his cabinet were saying that uh, you uh, have been um, untruthful and therefore we are resigning in protest against your leadership. Whether or not that is as a result of the fact that generally MPs uh, in, the, in the United Kingdom because of the electoral system remains to be seen, but it's something that obviously we will probe. Thank you. Thanks, um, Dr. Velikazi. Um, I think I just want to comment around the, um, the comment made about community mobilization and development. And I think within the local government suite of legislation, we have our ward committee system. And really, it might do us some good to say, how can we make that structure more robust? How can we make that structure the voice of the different categories of stakeholders that need to participate um, from civil society. And ultimately, the question to ask is, where are the activists? Because that's where they should be. Okay. So I think that was just a thought. Um, the other thing, um, thank you to the lovely lady from the DPSA, I think. Um, we are familiar with the ethics training that has been undertaken uh, in the public sector. It was targeted initially at national and provincial government, but I think we have partnered with the NSG as well to make sure that we try to introduce that type of training for municipal councillors. But we are a long way away from getting the kind of coverage that we need. You know, you, and it also depends on who you're training. You can either train influencers or you can train people who have time to go to training courses. And that's something completely different. So, so we do need to look at how we target it, how we package it, who we, who we target for such training. Leaders that, that we see in, 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 in government, in local government, those are the people that should be, we should start with, you know, and then cascade it. Um, and we can certainly collaborate on that. But the other element is training is the one side of the coin. The other side is the actual recruitment process. And what the study has found is that the recruitment process is flawed in itself. So we need to get that right um, and then we can move on to, to enhancing the, the capacity. Because capacity of the state is, uh, can be viewed at, at different levels. You know, we, we see individual capacity, organizational capacity, environmental capacity, different, different uh, lenses through which you can look at it. Um, so yeah, we, we need to look at it more holistically. And then to, to the lady who's really frustrated in the public service, there's hope. There's always hope. Um, so, for, for me, I'm, I'm a practitioner first, uh, and, and an academic only now, <laughs> to the very small part. Uh, my professor will tell you she pursued me for over a decade to do this. So, what I bring to the table as a public servant is that practitioner's perspective, coupled with what you would find in the theory. And we'll take that forward then as a practitioner and make it real. So what I've done is in my job sphere, and I know that it will add value. And if there's more public servants that can do that, we are adding to the system. Okay? And, and so I want to encourage you to, to do that. When you feel demotivated, invest in yourself. And then give it back. So, so that's really what, what I can say. Um, there'll always be some kind of interference, doesn't matter what. So become the best at being a good manager, become the best at being a good public servant, you know, give back and, and so on. Um, and let's look at a systems approach to everything that we do um, and be able to, to add to that. Uh, I think the, the, 
the one thing that we need to be as public servants is brave. Um, you know, because that's what ethics is all about. It's about integrity. And it starts with your own personal integrity. And, and that means that you've got to be brave and sometimes you're going to stand alone and say certain things that a whole lot of people are not going to like. Of course, you have to be tactful, otherwise you're going to get taken out, right? So you've got to learn all of these skills to survive, but at the same time to influence the change. And we have to have this conversation here amongst academics. But my question is, we need to also have it out there in the real world. So when we do training of councillors and when we do training of municipal officials, then these are the conversations we, we need to be having at that level also. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joey. Uh, we, we had uh, more questions and comments. Uh, I hear that uh, we have uh, about half an hour before lunch, so maybe we'll, uh, we'll finish before that. Or, but please don't make long comments because we have half an hour. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, we, we, we'll start with the gentleman here and then uh, the two ladies there and then uh, don't see other hands. Oh, the, 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 the gentleman at the... Oh, yes, uh, you, you, you... Oh, there's also online uh, questions, right? Okay. So, yes, uh, take it away, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I, was, uh, I was provoked uh, to comment. I thought I, I won't say anything. <laughs> I've said enough, I think. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the, the presenters uh, uh, for your presentation. I concur with a view that says, let, let us engage on all matters. And uh, uh, let us uh, express our views on where, uh, on where do we differ uh, with what is being said. Uh, uh, I think uh, the there must be no suppression of any voices. So I want to add on saying that I think on the issue of corruption, Chair, I wish that uh, people who, who share information and present on corruption can begin by uh, uh, giving us a correct conceptualization of what corruption is. And as a country, where do we come from with corruption? Because I think uh, we would uh, miss a, an opportunity of dealing with the problem where we live in a country uh, where we are informed that there is only, uh, there is only one man uh, who is corrupt in the country and there is only one party that is corrupt in the country. And we do not... Uh, uncover the untold uh, stories of corruption and how uh, this current government has inherited a corrupt system in the country and how have all those things contributed to where uh, we are today. Uh, the other fellow, uh, is, uh, uh, he says, uh, uh, or like, he comments on something that, that I have said earlier the issue of uh, active citizenry, because my view is uh, the problem is not uh, the system itself, but the foundation of the uh, problem are the people who contribute to, to the system that you have there. The citizens, we must agree, they are not capacitated enough even to select uh, uh, people who must do the accountability itself. Uh, look at one case of the African National Congress, how, uh, they, uh, how they have uh, uh, designed uh, their process of selecting uh, the world councillors. The final arbiter of who goes to the ballot are people who come from a community vote, even who are not the members of the organization. They say the community must select the people that they prefer over even the party team members. But even with that opportunity being given, how much 
have we transformed? How much have, have we done better with what uh, we had uh, before? And I think, uh, uh, colleagues, maybe if uh, your paper or your own research can go further to scrutinizing uh, uh, the internal organizational processes of each political part, that gives us uh, the final uh, uh, list of these uh, 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 candidates uh, to pilot their amendments. How these different organiza uh, organizations set up their internal processes to give us a uh, final product of what we have over there. But uh, the most important uh, factor is capacitating the citizens so to be able to do uh, the, the right thing. Then uh, the rest of the things will be secondary and tertiary. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll have the two ladies uh, on my left there. Uh, please, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, keep it brief because we, instead of uh, 30 minutes, I, I suggest we take like between 15 and 20, so that will be the first in line. On <laughs> Chair, <laughs> Chair, <Yeah>. my, <coughs> Chair, mine is more a quick comment, and I promise I'll be very brief. Yes. I actually want to salute our CC when she said that we need to have uh, academe and uh, government coming together. I couldn't agree with you more. It's something we always cry out. And I'm very glad to see that we're having this conversation and I'm glad that our university has been one of the forerunners in the planning of this. Uh, we need to have more conversations like this. You know, we need to have more research that is pragmatic, that's on the ground, that's hands-on. We need to have more practical case studies for sense making so that we can make a difference tangibly on the ground. And I'm glad that I heard the, the voice of the chat group that we need to have active citizenry involved as well because there's epistemic knowledge from those local communities that we need to tap into mm. so that we can make a difference on the ground. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, there's two ladies uh, there behind. Thank you and uh, good afternoon to all. Um, just in terms of the um, scholarship, active scholarship instead of career scholarship, I want to uh, just give feedback to that, to the extent that as government officials, I think we understand some of the challenges that are facing us, and us turning that into literature that could enhance the body of knowledge uh, really does go a long way. I think I took this decision to actually do my work in that manner because of the frustrations that I got within an institution. I felt that turning to a scholarly component gave me more power, which forced government to actually listen to what I had to say because I was talking from a scientific perspective and not just giving comments. If a premier or an MEC had something to say, I would say my research findings thus uh, advise. And I, I saw that really worked in terms of just championing the change that I wanted to see because I was able to then uh, pencil a book on corruption, maladministration, based on the case studies. Remember that COCTA does do uh, um, um, uh, um, investigations and I was able to turn those investigation, investigations into practical examples which scholars had to then also tap into to understand what is happening on the ground. So for me, I think in, ad, in just advising my colleagues, you need to perhaps go that route so that you can be out there. In that way, I'm a capacity builder in terms of a strate strategist, but I'm also able to tell the public that um, you're, 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 you you're um, actually appointing a counselor that does not know how to read and write does not assist you. And you find that the, the, the public actually gets quite alarmed that this person that they have actually appointed is unable to do their role of oversight. So those are some of the interventions and I think creative ways of us to be able to do work. And um, in this regard, um, you know, you end up advising even the highest body in the country in line with the research content that you have done because you are within government and you are also with the academics, which makes it easier to be able to um, uh, um, uh, 
provide synergy and a playing uh, uh, field on aspects. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think the other issue on whenever we talk ethics, we, 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 we think of the negative side of it, you know, fraud, corruption, but uh, we don't um, bring up um, good ethics, you know. We, we, we need to um, improve how we communicate about uh, good ethics. Uh, we, we want conversations where we can point that, you know, that institution upholds high ethical standards, you know, that individual is a man of integrity, but not also talking uh, ethics, but how does it relate to delivery of services on the ground? Um, uh, Prof. Figeni spoke about it earlier to say, once you stop caring about people, then you know um, that your conscience is, is in a coma. So it's not about, uh, you know, upholding ethical, good ethics, but it has to translate to service delivery. So I think we need to have those conversations as well, instead of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, painting everyone, uh, public servants, uh, with, with, with the same, same brush. So I think we need to uh, communicate more. There, there are good, you know, um, people out there who are delivered, and we need to, you know, talk about them. Um, I remember when I joined public service, my supervisor spoke about something very profound. Um, he was inspecting a uh, business establishment, he's a health inspector, and uh, one of the elderly guys says, no, I'm giving you 500 so that I, I can get my payment, and he said, you know what, this 500 will not take care of me if I get dismissed, you know. Uh, so with this 500, um, I propose that you fix ABC so that when I come next time um, inspecting, then you are able to get uh, your permit, you know. So it was so profound to have those kind of conversations in terms of how do you deal with temptations out there, you know. And, and it's very practical and educational to say how do you avoid. And the other issue, we also have a perception that um, uh, any form of corruption that happens in an institution is because of a, poli a politician. Uh, but it, it's very important that we have to build a, a relationship, you know, your political and administrative leadership where there is a mutual trust. So if the minister or MEC or mayor or councillor says something and you advise as an official in terms of uh, uh, our legislative framework, then that person should be say thank you, you know, for your guidance. And uh, but not only up to where to say it's not possible, but um, legislatively. So how can we solve this particular you know problem? We need to come with solutions instead of saying um, you know you can't, you can't, you can't. Mm -hmm. But what are the cans? You know, what are the options on the ground? Especially that has to do with delivery of services. So you need to build that mutual trust and, and be able to, you know, we shouldn't see every politician as being corrupt, but how do we educate them? How do we make uh, sound proposals um, that will, you know, enhance uh, delivery of services? So in the end, more conversations about, uh, you know, uh, institutions, individuals who upholds, you know, high, you know, ethical standards. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I think that that is a th those are fair points. Uh, is, is, is still, do you have a question or? Okay, we'll just take we'll just take uh, the last one at the back there. I think the the gentleman is commenting for the second time. I think that we will close after this. And oh, okay, there's two. Yeah. So after that, we will close. We'll give the. Oh, okay. We'll and then we'll go to the to the chat, and then we come back for the closing uh, remarks from the from the okay. panel. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate the study that has been done, and I highly feel that the comparative study is imperative. It has to be done, given your developing country and your developed country, because if you look at systems within the developed country, it's clearly working, regardless. And us as a developing nation. There's a lot to learn and a lot of value 
for those kind of adoptions into our own political system. Point one. Reason being, yes, the NDP stipulates as a perfectly designed political system, but it's questionable. We all know it's flawed. And we all know that, yes, there's lack of accountability, but there's no adequate measures in place to eradicate the lack of accountability. And given the thought of body of knowledge of my colleagues sitting in the front, it is, for me, as an academic as well, and a practitioner within my field, it is imperative and it is one of the things that we have to do, not consider in doing, but have to do, is partner, academia, partner, collaborate with government. Reason being, it's the only way government will be able to can take that rich value of scientific studies and start incorporating it within the different departments for it now to start functioning and operating effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the gentleman at the back will be the last one and then we'll give him um, um, the, the, the chats and then you, you'll be able to close after that. Uh, thank no, you, thank sir. you. Please be thank now. you, yes. Um, I think um, there was a point that was highlighted uh, yesterday, uh, I mean, by Professor Figeni about, or today, about the, the disjuncture between theory and practice, uh, implementation of policy. And I think also that same approach should be applied to research and its pra practicalities when, when it comes to contextualization of that research. And I think the previous two colleagues highlighted that there's a serious problem. Uh, uh, and most of the time in government, we are not even able to apply some of the research because it doesn't speak to the reality. It's what we could term, it's, it's cerebral. You know, it's just purely academic and a good uh, uh, research that to talk about, but, but when it comes to its implementation and informing practice, it, it just fails. So I would like the academic, and I want to reassure people on the stage, government has um, appointed a lot of academics. The, there's academics in this room, and they are doing the same research that they are doing, but the difference is they are doing it you know, within the context and, and, and faced by the realities that, that the government is facing. So there's lots of, of, of academics in, in government. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that. We'll just read the, the chats and then we'll close uh, with one minute uh, closing remarks. Thank you, Chair. There are three points or questions. Uh, we seem to have advanced in terms of structures, legislation, and systems to monitor accountability and ensure ethical behavior with less focus on instilling ethical culture starting at the leadership level. Culture is described as, and it's quoted, the magic startup ingredient, close quotes. To what extent have we ensured that strong ethical culture is instilled starting at our top leadership? Then the third, second one is from, and from your academic point of view, any views on a need to reform electoral systems as per the Zondo Commission? The last one, is it true or evidence-based that CADA deployment is the cause of the collapse of government, uh, gov cause of um, the collapse of governance in the public services, including state-owned enterprises? Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I will give you a minute each to, to wrap up, and then we will, we will, we will disperse. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on, on, on the gentleman at the back again, speaking on, on, on theory and, and reality, so to say. And I'll just say that I, I do believe that the perception of reality is realer than reality itself in most of the times. And that is, that is, that is what we, we, we keep on engaging on, especially after my lady also spoke about the NDP itself being flawed. We, 
we, we could collaborate also with government and also with academic, academics to, 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 to see these, these, these loopholes and these flaws in these documents so that we can have more niche into that. But other than that, thank you so much for the engagement. I truly do appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think my parting shot, I think there was, I'm not sure whether I didn't catch it correct, it was like about the electoral system and the Zondo Commission. Yes. Um, so, but I didn't get the question, but my parting shot would be, I think as a country, um, we must get to a point where things are said out loud um, and they are addressed. You know, South Africa and especially me as a black person coming from a black, you know, uh, family and black, we have these tendencies, including in our family, to say, you know, when something goes wrong, you can speak about it, you know, it will be dealt internally and things like that. So I think we must inculcate a culture where we are able to address issues boldly without uh, any fear of views being suppressed. We must get to a point where uh, we call each other out. You know, I, I made a point. Uh, when President Mbeki uh, formed uh, as, as the leader of the AU, established the African peer review mechanism, the purpose of that body was for statesmen to call each other out whenever they do something wrong on the continent. But you know, ever since the APRM was established and adopted, we have not seen that level of engagement between statesmen to say what you're doing in your country is wrong. So I think, I don't know whether it's a, it's a South African issue or an African issue, but I'm just saying that we must get to a point where we are able to call each other out, address issues. We are, um, and yeah, but I strongly believe that until we have an effective parliament that is able to perform oversight, um, NDP goals will largely remain a pipeline dream because Thank accountability you. can never be divorced from development. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks um, for the, the, the really constructive comments and uh, that, that we've received. I think just on, on the issue of... Um, of corruption. We saw in Tasneem's presentation earlier today, it's not just government that's lost, uh, has now this sort of trust deficit that is growing. Businesses equally lost that. So it's not just government, it's also business. Um, and much needs to be done to restore confidence of our people in, in the state. And the only way that we can actually do that is if we are able to account for the money that we spend, right? and if we are able to deliver the services that we promise to deliver. And that means that we've actually got to look into our internal machinery and look at all of those components um, that make the system work and try to improve them. So one of them is, is working on, on the audit committee. The issue of academia and, um, and practitioners um, there was a phrase used recently, and I, I, I'm, I'm quite sure that the president used it in his address recently. He talked about evidence-based decision-making. Is that right? It was the president. And I see that DPME now is starting to talk about evidence-based decision-making, and that the monitoring and, well, the, the planning units in departments are becoming more adept at monitoring and evaluation which is now requiring greater research into uh, what we are doing as, uh, as government. And, and that's the areas uh, or the mechanism that we can use to, to partner on. I think um, just on, on the ethical leadership, we've talked about trainings, but governance, I believe, is not understood. And I think we, the study proposes a model for financial governance that brings all the different stakeholders together um, towards the same, to, towards working at the same goals, and it also talks about a value-based governance model. So, so that's where we, we need to get to, I believe, and I think if we're able to do that, we, we would be successful. And then in closing, can I just say thank you to the University of KwaZulu-Natal, um, a premier academic institution, I might add, uh, and to its partners for this opportunity. Thank you so much. A round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for engaging uh, this, this research. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we may go for lunch. We have a 10 minutes headway. 
So we'll be one of the first people in the line. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, you need to check. Sorry, there's there's an announcement. Oh, you can. Sorry. Hi. Okay. Oh, okay. No, the, the announcement will be later, so you may go for lunch. <laughs> Apologies.
Volume, James.
Hello. Hello, delegates. <laughs> Anyone that needs to, for the gala dinner tonight, you need to register online. Uh, if you want, you can come here. Or you can scan the code from this laptop quickly and just put in your... I think there's only three questions you need and then you will be registered. The lady is sitting here in the front. If you need any assistance, she's putting the scanners together. No, I'm not cheering. Uh, about the color dinner is. Huh? You've, you've, you've indicated, right? Thank you so much. Colleagues, what we'll do is we'll join on. So if you're presenting on B1, on this breakaway session and the next breakaway session, you will stay here. We will have all five or so presentations so that we can finish by four o'clock. And then you can go home, freshen up, get ready to wine and dine. We'll, I, I'm, I'm pushing for four o'clock or 4.30. Yeah, 4.30 we are done so that you can go back, refresh, and then join us for gala dinner at the Coastlands Musgrave Hotel. So if you're presenting on breakaway session one, you need to stay here even for the next breakaway session if you're presenting on that breakaway session. And presentations will be 11 minutes now per person. Questions will be limited to, to seven minutes or six minutes. Make it fast if you want to get dinner. Without that, there's no dinner. Yeah, plus the technicians have to go and set up for our live band. Yeah. Thank you so much. The DJ is out. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I think, first of all, I'll check if we, everyone is here. We have a couple of presenters. Um, um, is privilege, I think privilege is on the stage now. And um, is Nyao Kumede in, uh, Livingston Smith. Oh, thank you. And uh, Dr. Sol Solomon, um, maybe he's still coming. All right, um, this is a very, very interesting topic and uh, it's something that is quite topical because um, I think in the light of load shedding and uh, what we've been experiencing recently and the, the cost and bailing out of uh, um, SOEs, has really brought a lot of debates in, uh, in, 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 in the midst of uh, what is happening around, uh, around this sphere. And uh, one continuously really tried to ask themselves, uh, from after the review of state-owned enterprises, they seem like nothing of the recommendation that were, were provided um, have really been implemented, of which um, if you look at, uh, we are now in 2022, and the, the NDP target is by 2030. The state-owned enterprises are part of, the, of what the government look at as, uh, for the, in the NDP as, as a driver of service delivery and structural development. And if we had to review that at this stage, I think we're still far, far away to, to really achieve that. So we will allow the, our presenters to really um, read the papers, and then uh, as uh, Dr. Kampule has mentioned, it's 11 minutes, and then we'll do a session, uh, seven minutes for questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Privilege Sheteni, thank you. And then. Okay. 
Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Uh, Privilege Chetani. I'm from the University of Forte. So today my presentation will be on uh, privatization of public enterprises in South Africa, problem and prospects. So, okay. Right, so this is my, uh, this is general, my general presentation outline. Uh, we'll start with introduction issues at hand, and I will speak about an agency problem, state ownership and privatization, then I conclude. Right, so to begin my presentation, I will start by one African proverb that says, if a man decides to carry his mother-in-law on his back across a flooded, a flooded river, he must be prepared to grab her buttocks. In other words, <laughs> what, this proverb, <laughs> what this proverb means is that there are some situations which demand serious, you know, drastic measures, but you will tend, you know, it will be a nightmare the rest of your life. Right, so, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> 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 all right, all right, guys. Okay. Right. So uh, basically, we, um, what we find ourselves in in this current uh, situation, it's a it's a case of having you know a serious choices to choose between privatization and and and, and nationalizing you know state in, state owned enterprises. So since the dawn of the democracy, one thing we've realized that uh, uh, South Africa went on to restructure its economy. And then it leads to, uh, to an international oriented and competitive uh, market economy. And then this meant that there is more liberal space, and then even the reforms were, li were liberalized in, in a way to be, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, you know, to fit in the, glo in the global context, right? However, since then, currently uh, in 2022, we still have this debate of economic transformation, and this debate is getting more ugly each, each day. Because uh, there are some people who believe that hey, these state-owned enterprises are failing, and some people, they believe uh, they need to be sold. But at the same time, poor people who are, ma who are majorly affected by these uh, changes, they see that as, uh, they see the debate, you know, moving to a, to, to, to a, uh, to, to a stalemate, uh, to say the, the least. So uh, basically, so now, uh, First, the transformation was to be achieved by what, uh, by, uh, through measures as nationalization. That's the first uh, 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 trait. And then the second, which we are currently doing, uh, the way I'm seeing it, is the adoption of more liberal approach in which the promotion of microeconomic development and growth of companies uh, uh, which will take precedence over radical redistribution. So, so another thing that we need to understand is that uh, public enterprises are operators agents in a way, rather than principals. So they usually operate without a pro profit motive, and then this leads to inefficiency in most cases because they don't have a burden to prove to, 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 the, to the society because they are an engine to growth in, in a way. So now we find that there is a, 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 in public, a public enterprises management, there's this, uh, they are unable to maximize profits, because they are conflicting and, and non-commercial objectives, just, just as I said. So this means that management under state ownership, uh, it, it merely addresses the standard operational procedures rather than maximizing profit. So, uh, theoretically, uh, national citizens are the true owners of the business that are run by the government. So in this, in this case, citizens are the owners of, this, of these so-called uh, SOEs. And then now, uh, 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 the issue at the end now is a stand in this, in this article, you argue that uh, privatization should be considered as several options and not the only policy response to SOEs underperformance as it has been uh, you know, shown currently that the more, more of our debate is on privatization, not on other alternatives, right? So now, uh, uh, the study just aims to, to find if uh, to find out to determine whether privatization is an antidote to South Africa uh, uh, state-owned enterprises, which have been failing in the past years. 
Right. On the agents problem, like, uh, like I said before, that uh, what, we, what we refer as corporate governments of SOF, SOEs is influenced by the state ownership role, government oversight role, and the board of directors oversight roles, and the agents implications of contracts between the government and these agents. So now what, what we see happening with these SOEs, we find that there's a lot of conflicting interests between the people who are acting, whether they, from the government side, from the private sector, and whoever is affected. So it's just more like, it's just more like an, an overnight you know, party. You know? So now what happens is that, uh, in, in, in essence, agents, they just lack incentive to increase their company's profit as a result of states' generous subsidies and lax budget constraint. Right. So, as we have seen with SIA Airways, there were a lot of bailouts, you know, until we reached this current tra uh, trajectory where it was, uh, you know, it was dismantled at, at the end of the day, and we are seeing the problem now, right? So now, the other problem which, which, which is created by this agents problem is that politicians, they usually omit the board of directors when making these operational and long-term decision of SOEs. Right, so for instance, the MP of transport can just slip over a decision and then the next day a dozen, a, what do you call those conference meetings, and then he announces something that the board is not even aware of, you know, and then, then, and then that thing is implemented. So now the, the, the problem with this uh, principal agent prob uh, problem is that it, it has a lot of potential conflicts, including between ministers, board of directors, and company executives. All right, so uh, in other cases, you find that uh, SOE's managers, they've got a close relationship with the government. You know, sometimes it leads to inefficiencies because you may be, you know, a, a, a rat is dining with a cat, you know, so something like that. So it doesn't work that way. <laughs> now, another thing, uh, you see that uh, there are politicians and bureaucrats who are more concerned about maximizing po political benefits, which leads to what economic uh, inefficiencies, right? And then uh, another problem is that we see strong politicians may develop strong relations with particular SOEs, giving them preferential treatment. Like uh, the, the, the issue of SA, ESCOM, these are the most prominent SOEs that we talk about, as if they're the only one, yet there are many, right? So now, there is this uh, thing where top executive, board members, and government representatives rely on reciprocal opportuni opportunism, right? In an, in an effort to impose their agendas on SOEs. You know, so this reciprocal opportunism is whereby I help you, you help me, something like that. I mean, okay. So as a result, uh, as a result, three minutes. As a result, the agents' cases can appear in many forms, including corruption and self-dealing and shaking and moral hazard. Right. So, I, the issue of state ownership I've already alluded to because I see I'm being signaled for time, even though I haven't spoken that much. <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay, so. Okay, let me just, right, let's start here. This is how, how, how the current democracy works. Initially, it was the people uh, who select the government, and then the government uh, controls the corporations, but today it's vice versa. If it's, as you see, those arrows are going upwards since the, the great industrial revolution. A lot has changed, right? So it's now the corporation controlling the government, and then the government controlling the people. So this is what, exactly where we are currently, right? So now, a simple case of why public enterprises are a problem. There's ESCOM, there's this ESCOM dilemma. You know, because even when I'm, when I'm talking now, it can go off. Anything can happen here. So uh, we find that SA is a lot of coal and these other, uh, because it's, the comparison is between SA and other these BRIC countries. As we see that SA is a lot of coal, and, we use, and so our main sources of, of energy is coal and oil, right? So then, suddenly, then we have this issue of renewable energies. How do you turn around that 71% and cancel it to 2% and then, you know, like, the mess doesn't add up. Even met literates, you know, sometimes, <laughs> the mess doesn't add up, right? So, but that's what we are trying to do currently, right? So wh what happens is that, uh, in the long run, we found, 
this, re, this re, uh, what do you call this data, is where perception of corruption by institution, where people are asked which institution is the most corrupt. Now, who is supposed to impose those policies who are done by ESCOM? People, they complain, they say, ah, police are the most corrupt. But who is supposed to arrest the corrupt person? It's the police. Now you come, who is more corrupt than the police, the government officials? Who is doing the police, the government officials, okay? Right, so then come to who agrees to the police. It's the legislator with the parliament. And that the third corrupt people that people see as corrupt. <laughs> so now, as we see that with, uh, in most cases, as we go by the, the buy-in, you know, there's no buy-in from the people. So it's, it's just a, a, a tale of two cities, right? So now this is what is happening. ESCOM is trying as hard to stay, you know, like to, be, to save the poor. And, and then we have a police here which says, okay, uh, uh, if you keep on, we're going to stage nine. Remember there was an issue of stage nine, stage 10. And then, now when we are in stage 12, this is what is happening now. You see, so, so with time, we may, we may reach the stage where we need to privatize. But, <laughs> okay, so uh, what needs to be done, the government must address uh, administrative inefficiencies and corruption. Uh, and another thing, there's this issue of code of conduct in SOEs. They are, they are hardly implemented. A lot of these code, code of conduct, they are just posted in walls, but nothing is, uh, is done. There's too much chronicism, favoritism, and nepotism. Right. So all these things, they affect how SOEs operate. And then appointments of, uh, to boards uh, should be based on competencies of those people appointed. Just like recent, there's an there's SAPC board which has appointed, and an ESCOM board again which has appointed, but based on competitors, I hope hopeful, and then they should be given autonomy. Another thing that is lacking is the trust between the government and the people. So it is just been eroded, you know, to a point where uh, some people they really don't trust whatever is being said by the government. Yes. And then another issue that needs to be solved. The government needs to choose between three, three options. Commercializing the organizations while maintaining state control. And then privatizing is it or entirely or it's partly, or keeping public funds flowing into these SOEs uh, despite losses and inefficiencies, right? So the current situation is that we're trying to avoid number three, right? So in terms of choosing which policy to, to use, it's becoming more tricky, right? But if SOEs uh, implement some of these suggestions, things may, may work in, in, in the long run. So another thing that is, that is not there is the, is the monitoring system. There is no effective monitoring system in the government, you know? So it's, it actually creates a lot of problems for those who run, who run uh, SOEs because there is no way that they can really monitor how they are making losses and how they are making you know, profits and, and the likes, right? So I think this is where I'm t my time is down, but I'll close again with another proverb. The only woman who knows about her men whereabouts is a widow. <laughs> so in other ways, we're trying to say, those who know a policy, you need to ask those who have implemented it, right? So, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was quite, a, that's quite interesting. I think... Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. So I think, I think the main thing is the two proverbs. You open with a very interesting proverb, and uh, um, what I'll say... <laughs> you see? So... With the first proverb, I think the, the, what you opened up with was um, the whole issue around uh, government will continuously bail out um, SOEs unless there is a, a, a good business case that government needs to put forward or else it will continue carrying it and even though it might remain an uh, un uncomfortable situation. But I think also how do we really have SOEs serving driving the developmental agenda and dealing, uh, answering social issues without them being profitable. 
that I think then that becomes another, another agenda, another dilemma. So um, let me allow the floor for questions. And do, can you show of hands? Yes, there's one. Prof has a hand. Um, yes, there's another hand at the back. So we can start with Prof and then we'll move around. Yes. Can, Mike? Thanks. Can, Prof, you can go ahead with your question. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Privilege, thank you for the presentation and especially the, uh, the, the beginning and the end. <laughs> uh, um, I think you're missing a very important point here about SOEs and the rationale for their existence. And that fundamentally is to render basic services mainly to the poor. I, I, I'm not concerned about SAA because poor people don't fly. So that can be privatized or sold off or whatever. But I am concerned about the ESCOMs, the Transnets, uh, and so on, because they provide the public services for, to enable poor people. So it's very important that the state gets its act together very quickly. Because you can see that there is a very strong tendency towards thinking about privatization. And privatization, as you know, is the worst possible option for the poor. Right? I mean, the government is hastily transferring el electricity capacity to the private sector. <coughs> and there's a lot of international evidence on this, particularly from uh, Margaret Thatcher's Britain, uh, where she privatized all these state-owned companies, uh, thinking that there would be competition. And what happened really was you converted public sector monopolies eventually into private sector monopolies. And the poor don't benefit for that. So I think what is missing from your paper is the, really the public goods argument for why we need state-owned enterprises. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to find out, uh, uh, taking from what Professor is saying, uh, if the public entities are to serve the poor or to serve the poorest of the poor, have you not <coughs> questioned why the highest levels of salaries even more than that of the president. And I mean, what justifies that? And uh, in my view, I feel that the heads of departments uh, in, public, in, in the public service are actually working very hard, harder than those uh, in, the, in the public entities. How do you justify that? Have you ever maybe looked at that area and questioned and what justifies the high levels of remuneration in those levels, thank you. All right, can do you have more questions? Yeah, yes. Given that we have so much of investment made in um, coal as and reserves i mean we all know we have so many coal mines raking in literally billions of rands are we really serious as a country about going towards renewable energy or is it just going to become another 10 years of a talk shop because we last went to cop 17 and we spoke the same language and here we are back in 2022 still talking 71% dependency on fossil fuel for our energy. So I'm asking, is there not too much of investment 
and a business model built around fossil fuels in this country, and how are we going to change that mindset and that dynamic? Thank you. Uh, if we, yeah, there's another hand here. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I would like you to reflect on this personal observation with regards to coal in South Africa. Um, in Germany, for instance, recently, they are enlarging their coal generation plant. Um, whilst in South Africa, we are exporting even bigger volumes of coal through trucks. It has been uh, confirmed that uh, over the last three months, the amount of trucks that are exporting coal from South Africa has increased phenomenally, uh, while at the same time they are causing a lot of um, accidents to the South Africans. Uh, now, we find it ironic, I personally find it ironical that uh, when the Western countries are calling for the doing away with uh, coal-generated powers, yet they continue to expand um, theirs and we are exporting uh, coal in big numbers uh, to the risk of high accidents uh, on our roads. As we travel from uh, Peter Marisbeck to Deben, we don't know whether we would come back alive on a daily basis. Uh, so it's a high risk to the South Africans, but yet uh, we are seeing this, uh, this juncture that is uh, going on within our country. Who is holding uh, our government accountable for such decisions? Thank you. All right, if we don't have any more questions, I'll give the presenter the floor to, to respond. Right, on, on the first question of ICT. Right, uh, on the first question, uh, uh, which was brought by Prof. Uh, on, on, on the part where, you, where you're talking of the uses of SOEs, it's just that, like, like I said, I had to skip a, a number of slides. But it's there. Uh, remember, SOEs, like I said in, the, in, the, in, the, in my first uh, statement, I said SOEs are an engine for growth. So in other words, there is no state, even the Western, if you remember the great industrial revolution, which happened uh, long back in 1890s and so forth, there was a lot of burning of coal. So these, these guys, they burned a lot of coal, yet they'd leak, and then they finished the coal, now they talk of energy, of renewable energy. But us as Africans, we're still, we're still in, that, in that step. You know, we have a lot of it, you know. So now, the only question that I don't, the only thing I really don't understand about this um, ESCOM issue is, uh, there is no way that you can talk of renewables as an engine for growth. Given even Britain now, they still use coal. German, they still use coal. They just do renewables in stadiums and, 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 and the likes, and then they use uh, natural gas, right? So it's the, 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 the major reason for, for us having a state-owned state enterprise is the issue of that you want to develop. And then SOEs is our, our, our leverage for, for the mostly dis disfranchised uh, blacks, you know, while mainly poor in terms of uh, assessing those services, like train, like your electricity and, and, and water and, and the likes. So yeah, uh, SOEs are actually in, in, uh, needed. That's why even in this study we, we had said, why is, is it only privatization? Why is it we're only hearing about privatization only? As if it's the only solution. And why is it privatization looks yummy? Because it's, a, it's an outside uh, policy at the end of the day. Like now, I think it was yesterday, IMF was around, it was here, they were doing an oversight, right? And then they said, SA should quickly privatize, you know? So in other ways, the policy is an external policy, this one. We don't know about it, but it's, <laughs> that's what is happening, you know? And then the second part, uh, the, the, is related to talk about salaries of SOEs. That's where the problem is, the urgency problem. There is a there is a there is a blurred line be, between what politicians do and what 
uh, professionals should do in this, in this regard, especially with SOEs, you know, because there's too much interference, right? So that interference, um, it leads to, 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 you know, to this ballooning of salaries. There's someone, sort of you're buying someone. That's a reciprocal I was talking about. Well, you help me and I help you, kind of thing. And then, uh, and then these inflated salaries, that's the reason why we need to, you know, to cut. <laughs> I'm an economist, by the way, so <laughs> my, my, my views are very controversial anyway. So, <laughs> so that's why we need to cut the bloated public, you know, you know public workforce, because a lot, a lot of, it's a, it's a huge salary bill for, for, for the treasury anyway. Right, so on, on the third part, um, right, is it, we raised about renewables, how serious are we, we are about renewables. Uh, personally, I don't think given, uh, personally, I don't think we are at the right time to be talking of renewables, given uh, ESCOM is, is actually selling electricity outside South Africa. So it, it's sort of, it, your, your, your house is full of tomatoes, but you don't have soup. So that's the kind of debate we're having. So now, so, so the reason why there is still energy is quite clear now where, the, where there is a miss in the policy in, in, in terms of how government wants to address this ESCOM issue. It's clear that the policy is not from within, you know, because obviously everyone sees the problem. That, no, we're going on stage six. No one has ever been in stage six. Even your, your own stove, you hardly switch it to stove six unless you are cooking some trotters and some cow head. You know, so those, even these days they are ridiculous. So you, you, <laughs> you see the problem is even bigger now. And then the last question was on this. Uh, yeah, you spoke about these trucks who are exporting coal. Yeah, basically that's what is happening. So sort of is a, we, can, we call it pseudo looting or you are selling a product which is already needed in the market, you know. So you're sort of pseudo looting. So when you go back to the issue of corruption, it comes back again to that slide I played. Where do you want, where do you need to report police? These are the same people that people are saying are corrupt. So what are the chances of them acting? They will report to the politician. They are part of the problem again. Then you go to the parliament, it's signed again, it goes back to police. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's just a, a, a rerun, like, you, you know, there's nothing which is moving, like, you know. So I think I have covered, but then in terms of accountability, in terms of these accidents which are happening here in Pine Town, it's, it's actually bad, right? Why? It's a police, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, there is a police which is needed again in trying to address the issue of trucks traveling uh, with small cars or mixing with small cars and roads and the likes. But the major problem, I think you, you, you're talking of that, there are a lot of trucks which are carrying coal. If I go to right, you say there are, there, these are a lot of trucks where ferrying coal to these other places and causing accidents, right? So you see the problem. Even, even the trucks, they don't, they don't want to be ferried. So it's a problem on its own. So, so yes, yeah, so, so I think um, I have covered enough in terms of my presentation. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks, Dr. Chilen, Chilen Chiteni. Um, and I think there's, they will we'll continue with this debate of around just transition and whether we, how can we, this country can become energy efficient and move away from coal. But I think central to that is also what Prof. raised that uh, most of these SOEs, some of the, like if you look at ESCOM and the rest, they, they are there to serve the needs of the, of the poor. But uh, when we speak about moving away from coal and how will the poor also benefit from the, the, that process itself, it is very critical. It's something that we also need to look at very clearly. Thanks. Um, I will then move to, the, to our next presentation, which is from uh, Livingston Smith from the University of KwaZulu Natal. So, thank you. My guy was helping me with. Uh, I should have it.
Um, greetings to everybody. Um, I must declare that I'm touching on a very uh, debatable subject and uh, again declaration of interest that we have experienced the fourth industrial revolution now and uh, for those of us who will find it very difficult to attend the gala dinner that, that will be because of uh, the problem of the fourth industrial revolution because we did not or we were unable to RSVP. Um, yeah, just, just, just uh, by the way. Um, yes, as it has been said, my name is Livingston Smith and the topic is taking advantage of the fourth industrial revolution to build a globally com a competitive state and economy. I'm not going to talk about the definition of the fourth industrial revolution because of time and uh, assuming that we all understand what it is, but noting that the fourth industrial revolution is being touted as having the capacity to lift South Africa out of the challenges of the poverty, unemployment and inequality, or inequitable distribution of wealth. But noting that the state uh, of the country's readiness to, for the enabling technologies of the foreign realm is questionable. Now we have a problem of, as much as we say the fourth industrial revolution has got a capacity to take us out of the poverty, inequality and stuff, but how ready are we to, 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 to execute and use it to our own advantage? Now, that comes from the background that the competitiveness of the state depends on the capacity of its industry to innovate and upgrade. And that can be created and sustained through a highly localized process. Now, the highly localized process in, is another discussion. How localized are we in terms of our manufacturing, in terms of our advantages that we can take? So. We have engaged various literatures in terms of uh, getting to understand what the concept is and what the challenges are in South Africa. But the common themes that came or that emerged in the literature review included uh, the South African policy framework, data mining, data mining. Yes, I wanted so if you're not looking so that I can be very clear, it's data and then it's mining. Yes. And the South African economic landscape. Now this study, the studies suggest that competitiveness of the state depends on the capacity of in industry to innovate and upgrade and that can be created and sustained through highly localized process. Yes, that I've highlighted again. Theoretical framework. What are the theories that we come, we, we, we get from there? Uh, readiness, are we ready to embrace? Technological innovation, are we ready to uh, move into the technological field and digital innovation? So, but what the theory suggests is that technological and social capability countries underline how countries with high levels of technological and social capabilities could be considered ready to take full advantage. Now, are we, as South Africa, uh, technologically and social capable? Now, social capable is another very controversial and very debatable subject. How social are we? For South Africa to capitalize on the fourth industrial revolution, it will need to address the problem of digital divide. Digital divide. Those that are helping us to RSVP and those that are queuing to be helped to RSVP. <laughs> That's a digital divide in practice. <laughs> yes. To prevent further widening of the socioeconomic gap between the rich 
then the rich will be digitally skilled. Now, if you are digitally skilled, you have a potential of being rich. And if you are digitally unskilled, then it's the poor side of the society. Dimensions for the, fourth, for, for the theoretical framework. Now, when we talk about the dimensions, we've picked up um, the technology fit dimension, task, technology, and fit characteristics. And the viability dimension consists of three factors such as economic, organizational, and information technology variables. Now, I'm not going to spend much on this one, and as much as the conceptual framework as well, uh, which look at the human development, because I'm going to cover the human development in my conclusion and my recommendations. Uh, tax and investment incentives. Tax and, uh, and investment incentives, digital, digital innovation hubs. Then we talk of the government subsidizing and giving tax incentives for industries and for uh, corporations that are assisting in the terms of the digital industrialization. Now, it says, this is the cross-cutting principle that applies to leveraging technological change, building technological capabilities and building economic uh, competitiveness. Research methodology, it talks about where we got the information so that I'm distancing myself is not my creation. So that is where we got the information. We got respondents from government, we've got from uh, CSIR and practice, which we find uh, on the ground. Research findings, that is very important. The study revealed that South Africa is still lagging in terms of the adoption and of the fourth industrial revolution, and that is a problem. We are still lagging, we are far behind in terms of the fourth industrial revolution. And this happens while the world is already moving to the fifth industrial revolution. And we are still struggling with the fourth, and the world is now moving into the fifth. So we are far behind. South Africa is dependent on high speed mobile internet artificial in, in, in intelligence, the internet of things, and the youth of data analytics, drones, and cloud technology which require high internet connectivity. And for those of us who were here from beginning of the conference, we will know it's the connectivity, and I was excited when the Premier herself highlighted that only 11% of the population of KZN is connected then you can see what the problem we are facing. Now, how do we move into the fourth industrial revolution when we are not connected? The study further revealed that various industries face challenges such as job losses. Yes, that is why most of the uh, corporations are closing down. Uh, I'm not going to mention names uh, for fear of being uh, taken to, to task, but most of the corporations are closing down. Unstable electricity supply, my uh, colleague has just highlighted, water crisis, uh, cy cyber crime and security breaches, climate change and the lack of localization for industry and supply. Conclusion. It is common knowledge that fourth industrial revolution technologies, if correctly employed, if correctly employed, I'm repeating, can bring about economic competitiveness. But South Africa has the political will. Yes, I'm confirming. South Africa has the political will to deliver the best fourth industrial revolution. But the best policies, as we are sitting here, uh, we are looking at various policies. But the best policies alone cannot guarantee effective implementation. It will always remain a policy but the implementation is another part, and it will require best qualified individuals. So in order to benefit from the fourth industrial revolution, South Africa still has to deal with the realities of the unstable power supply, short supply of skilled workforce, 
and the things that we highlighted. Lastly, this is my last slide, uh, so it's fine. I'm right on time. South Africa requires a national strategic proactive approach across stakeholders that can take advantage of the opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution and position itself as a leader in the exporting our competitive and competitive advantage. Now, there has to be a stakeholder engagement with a particular focus on upskilling and reskilling. Upskilling and reskilling. And otherwise, if we don't follow that trend, we are going to have a South Africa that is staying in the dark ages. And this partnership should include the private sector. Private sector, yes. Noting the organizers, I must emphasize. In this uh, gathering here, we do have the private sector. No, no, we do have the public sector, which is government. We have academia, but we are not hearing much of the voice of the private sector. And that is one thing that we need to consider uh, moving forward when we organize such gatherings, because those are the absorbers, those are the users of the skills that we are going to produce. And yes, it is all in our hands. What we do with it, we can put it down and crack it, or we can run with it and make it work. And thank you for not asking questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think, yeah, that is uh, quite interesting because as when you are in a major metropolitan or in a space like we're in, it, it looks easy. You, can, you have access to fast internet, you have access to fiber and all that. But uh, when you look at the digital divide in, in a country with in the rural areas uh, where people already need access to some of these services, then you realize how hard it is. Um, um, I will allow the, 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 the questions again, uh, then, so that um, Livingston, Livingston can, can respond. Do you have any questions? Yeah, there's one there. <laughs> he does one question, but there is one already. <laughs> any other hand? Yeah, there's a second hand. Yes, can you have the mics, please? Um, greetings, my name is Tipesi Shagunene from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, I want to ask a question. Um, you highlighted that um, we're still stuck in the fourth industrial revolution, and you also acknowledged that even the Premier um, acknowledged that 11% um, of um, the population in KwaZulu-Natal is not connected. So in your study, were you able to perhaps um, establish um, recommendations on what can be done in that case, you know, because what uh, I've also observed is that a good initiative by the Department of Home Affairs, wherein now you can book and your slots online and go there once you have been um, confirmed a session. So for rural areas, for those who are not connected, was the study able to at least establish any recommendations in terms of how can we deal with the challenge of connectivity, wherein we are expected to actually fast track um, the issue of fourth industrial revolution. Thank you. All right, we have another question here. Sorry, if you can bring the mic. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Program Director, and good afternoon to uh, Mr. Smith. And thank you for the presentation. Um, mine, I'm going to go back, and I think by now colleagues, they will get used to this, that I, I have a problem because we chose a particular dispensation as this country when we adopted a developmental state aspirations. So the question is, if we are a developmental state, who is running after us? When I borrow from your presentation, of the privatization of ESCOM with the policemen running after. Who is running after us and forcing us to move at the world speed when we've got developmental, serious developmental issues 
that are basic needs that you have not attended to. Prof spoke about somebody who is not flying and therefore they will not be too concerned about the success or the failures or the survival of uh, um, South African Airways vis-a-vis -vis having an electricity and water at home. So for me, I find it very difficult that we seem to be chasing ourselves to the world, and yet we are saying we are a developmental state. That has not achieved the basic steps of a developmental state. So can you then talk to that, contrasting it to the needs of the world that is entering the fifth um, uh, uh, industrial revolution, and us that are still battling if we are to make the trade-offs, where should we make those trade-offs? Because for me, I will say, for IR, it will be one of those trade-offs that if I'm to compare with health sector, education, and others. Thank you. All right, uh, there's a hand on the other side, thanks. And Prof, I can start on the other side. Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, and our presenters, um, I've got a question with the fourth IR, and, and this links with literacy and also ethics. Now, I know the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies, former DTPS, former DOC, um, have worked on the digital opportunity strategy. Um, if we look at the growth of ICTs uh, and the technical capabilities, we must also consider the literacy rates and ethics that comes with how do we handle these technologies because it's almost like giving people a car without them having done a learner's license and a driver's license. Um, do you have any practices, training, abilities, projects in place to assist with this? All right. Before I ask the question, I have a request. Yes, yes you can go ahead, uh, Prof. Lady here is suffering from the air conditioning. Oh. So if right. you could turn it down a bit. I, I, don't want, I don't want to have to carry her out as if she were my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Less important stuff, the question. Um, to what extent is it possible for a country like South Africa to join this uh, f uh, fourth industrial revolution given the state of our education and training system? Mm -hmm. And given the state of the education and training system, moving ahead with the, the fourth IR will only serve to reinforce the inequalities we already have. So it's a dilemma that we find ourselves in, so I'd be interested to hear your views on that. Right. Thanks. Any other question? I think you can go ahead and answer. Sorry, Prof. It uh, looks like it is centrally controlled, and uh, I'm from HSRC, UKZN. Um, thank you, colleagues, for the, 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 the questions. Uh, I, I will start with the prof. Uh, to what extent can we join the fourth industrial revolution, considering our state of uh, uh, illiteracy and uh, education? Well, this is one of the core discussions. What interventions can we make? And I must declare, like I declared up front, uh, that me standing here, uh, I'm not a messiah coming from anywhere. But we are sitting in a conference that must come up with uh, recommendations and guidelines to say we have identified gaps. And what are we doing with those gaps? And if we are all sitting here and we identify that there is a lot of inequalities, there's a lot of illiteracy, there's a poor connectivity and stuff, uh, then we, we, we need to come up with the recommendations that say how do we then deal with such. But when I say we, uh, I'm not saying I have to come up with. 
But it, it is one of the things that we have identified, which is why in my recommendations I said, if we have academia, uh, which is your, 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 your TVET colleges, uh, universities of technology, universities sitting here, and yes, we then have uh, the industry, which is the private sector. The private sector saying, are you giving us what we want? Uh, we spoke about, uh, I think it was a premier as well who harbored on this part, saying there is a mixed mesh of what the, 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 the institutions are producing and what the industry is requiring. But if we do not have that dialogue, and if we don't get into the boardrooms and get into the conferences, get into our uncomfortable zones and tell each other in the face and say, what are you giving me doesn't work. Those are realities that we are always going to remain where we are. But for us to move forward, we need to get everybody sitting and saying, yes, you are giving us graduates, but if the graduates that you are giving us are similar to the graduates that you gave us in 1970, and in 1890, which are useless, excuse my French, but they are not helping the industry at this stage. So we have highlighted a, similar, a simple case uh, of saying um, we, 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 we are RSVP. But yes, if you look at um, the, 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 the hospitality industry as an example, uh, I was taken aback or excited when I saw KFC uh, putting it in a broad, excited, saying now they have opened up one shop, one outlet in South Africa. Then you can say to yourself, how many outlets does KFC have? Now, one outlet out of those that where you can only order online and you can go and see nobody. But if you look at other countries like um, uh, your Japan, Korea, and others, you can walk into the restaurant and see no one, but get service, get the best service. It's a sabotage. Yeah, let's, let's call it as it is. Oh, uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I'm saying, I'm saying that these are realities of where we are. Uh, and we need to sit down and say, what is your mandate as the universities, universities of technologies, and TVET colleges? And if there are other institutions that we can come up with, we can establish such and say, now we need to prioritize the digital skills. And that has to happen as of yesterday. And that is, I'm hoping it answers the last question and covers a few of the things. But the issue of the literacy uh, issues, yes, it is an issue that we are living with, but South Africa has done well in terms of uh, eliminating, yes, 1994, if you even check your, 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 your studies and your, 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 your history, it will tell you 1994, or before 1994, South Africa had a high level of illiteracy. But today, that has gone down. I think we are now sitting at about 97, if not 99, today, of literacy. Those are people who can read and write. And if they can read and write, those are people who can uh, participate in the fourth industrial revolution. Now, who is running the affairs? Who is chasing after you? One of my fellow um, friends said to me, at some point, it refers to the ethics that we spoke about in the morning, and Mubarak uh, Mohammed, who I used to chat with him, uh, he's got a background in football and administration, said, you need to be honest, even when nobody is looking at you. Why do you need to be chased? You know, so that, that's a critical part where you look around and see nobody is watching, then you start doing wrong things. We need to be accountable to ourselves before we become accountable to the population of South Africa. 
if you are still comfortable because nobody knows how much money you pocketed, which was supposed to build few houses for few people out there, then you, are de you do not deserve to be in the public service. And for those few words, I, I want to say, yes, it is our responsibility, all of us, to take South Africa forward. It is not one person's job. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. While um, we're still trying to solve the issues of four IR on the other side, um, <laughs> we have um, our third presenter. He will present from UJ via Zoom. Yeah. And uh, I think there's another question on the, uh, on the floor, from the floor. So, yeah, we'll allow okay. that. Yes. Mine is just a comment to say that uh, we are trying, but. Uh, uh, our societal fiber that, uh, you know, the, the, the issues of stealing or taking things that do not belong to you are also a deterrent. I remember that the, the iPads or something were introduced in schools, given to, to kids to start, you know, engaging with the with the technology, but people who knew that the, the kids were provided with such gadgets, they blocked them on the roads and they stole them. And that prevented uh, other you know, schools to, to, to do that, to, to provide. So our societal fiber, and I think uh, crime is one of those things, but it's always blamed on the police. But I just wanted to, to put forward to say, uh, the police cannot be in each and every road to block people from stealing. Mm -hmm. it, it speaks to us as parents, how we raise our children to say, you cannot say, take anything that doesn't belong to you. It starts from there. And uh, the, uh, you know, I've heard people always, you know, the police are not doing anything. For instance, I just want to bring this again to light. I know it's not something that is talked about, that the police cannot be in each and every home or each and every street or each and every forest to prevent rape from happening. Mm -hmm. They come after the effect. So. Uh, people must actually understand that before we can blame everything on the police, we have to look at ourselves as parents, how we raise our children to say sometimes the way that we allow things to happen in our homes actually flows into the community, to society, and we start blaming each other, uh, whereas this technology could have really, really uh, made, made, uh, made roads, be, but it's prevented by those people who are, are stealing from others' things. Thank you. But I, I think what is critical here and what is coming across is that sometimes in uh, sessions like this, we end up being very academic around issues and then not trying to really look at what are the main critical issues that we need to really deal with in, in the society itself and uh, look at how we can measure, try to, to really get a solution to, to such. Right, uh, we'll have the next, um, the next presenter via Zoom, and... Uh, uh, it's a video. Yeah, it's a, it's a video, so we wouldn't be able to ask questions. Okay, no, all right, it's a video that was sent by Dr. Muller from um, UJ, and it is a critical reflection on state capture, thanks.
pre-recorded presentation. My apologies for that. It's just that uh, when you do this, I'll be traveling. I hope to be online to receive your questions, but I'll be uh, at Heathrow Airport, um, and that's probably not a very conducive place to, to do this presentation. So I thought I'd pre-record it. Um, I gather we have in total 90 minutes for four presenters, so I will try to keep to uh, about 15 to 20 minutes maximum, and then hopefully be able to take any questions uh, that you might have afterwards. So the title of, uh, of this paper and this presentation is Parliamentary Oversight and State Capture, Critical Reflections on the State Capture Sub-Inquiry Report. And my name is Sean Muller, I'm at the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Johannesburg. So just to give you some brief background, I'm, I imagine the majority of, of the audience, if not everybody, is, is familiar with this, but just to make sure. Um, the State Capture Inquiry was formally announced in 2017, and after some contestation about who would be appointed to lead it, uh, Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zonda was named as the chairperson. Its terms of reference were gazetted in January 2018, and its rules were gazetted in July 2018. Sometime after that, and after the inquiry had commenced, uh, the evening of the Judge Zonda announced the establishment of what was referred to by some as a sub-inquiry into Parliament. Evidence had already uh, been given in relation to the conduct of Parliament or inaction by Parliament in relation to some of the issues more directly related to the Commission's terms of reference. Um, but Judge Zondo announced that there would be uh, a sub-inquiry, a specific uh, focus on Parliament, the role of Parliament and parliamentary oversight. And that was to be headed by advocate uh, Freund, SC, Senior Counsel. Um, and the evidence was heard from around, as I recall, about mid-2020 into 2021. And as part of that sub-inquiry, the main expert witnesses that were called, um, so by expert witness there, I'm partly referring uh, directly to expertise, but also to distinguish them from, for example, members of parliament who also gave evidence um, in various capacities. So these were uh, Associate Professor Richard Calland, Professor Hugh Corder, um, both Professors of Law, and Jennifer Ralph Smith on behalf of the Parliamentary Monitoring Group, um, as somebody who had observed um, observed the conduct of Parliament um, partly over, over the period of time in question, but also in, in other periods. Um, so what I'm going to zoom in on here, given the little time we have, uh, first of all, are the findings and recommendations of the uh, State Capture Inquiry Report that um, was um, delivered to President Robert Poser and then subsequently published. Um, so I'll focus on, on, a, on a subset of these. Um, so first of all, the, the, the findings and recommendations appear to endorse a constituency-based electoral system. When I say appear to endorse, what I mean is here that uh, the, the phrasing of the recommendations is not such that they direct Parliament to do something that would in any case be a breach of the separation of powers, um, but uh, the recommendations recommend that Parliament considers a given issue or a given action. So um, this particular recommendation, 227.2, recommends that Parliament can consider the merits of a constituency-based electoral system. And I take that to be an implicit endorsement. Certainly, if the Commission felt that there wasn't merit to such a system and to change into such a system, it would not appear as a recommendation. Um, so that's what I mean by appears to endorse or implicitly endorses, as I say below. So it appears to endorse the constituency-based electoral system. Um, it endorses the notion that portfolio committees failed in their oversight duties in part due to a lack of resources. Um, uh, you can see that recommendations 227.5 and 227.6. It implicitly endorse, endorses the notion that opposition chairs of committees would improve outcomes. So having a member of an opposition party chair a parliamentary committee would improve parliamentary oversight. Um, and it recommends consideration of a particular set of proposals on appointments by Parliament. That was actually a set of proposals uh, made by the organization Corruption Watch. Um, so let me just summarize uh, the six main criticisms uh, of my paper of this Parliament sub-inquiry. So first of all, um, I raise concerns about the appropriateness of selecting a senior counsel to lead such an inquiry. 
Uh, this was common practice within the broader state capture inquiry itself. And one could argue that made sense because the intention was essentially to look at um, illegal activities, corruption, and matters that could subsequently be prosecuted within the criminal justice system. But it's less clear that an investigation into something much broader, uh, like the um, effectiveness of parliamentary oversight, is something that's best led by a lawyer of any kind, uh, a lawyer or a judge or senior counsel. Um, and it's, it's unclear why such a person would have the necessary expertise to make an assessment of something that involves um, uh, questions of um, institutional competence, um, societal dynamics, societal structure. Uh, these are not typically questions that um, are expert in. in. So that's the first concern. Um, so a second concern, which in some ways compounds the first, is regards the selection of individuals who are invited to testify as experts. Um, it's not, I should also say that it's not at all clear how that selection is made. I should mention as a, as a declaration of interest uh, uh, of sorts that um, when I, I previously worked at Parliament uh, in the Parliamentary Budget Office for two years uh, in a period of time that overlapped with the period of state capture, um, and through some, some of my former colleagues, I became aware that uh, there was a request for submissions to, to the sub-inquiry, and I made a submission. Um, to my knowledge, the, the contents of that submission was not used. Um, which is fine, uh, although I have, I have no reason, uh, I have no understanding as to, to why it wasn't used. But be that as it may, um, the, as I listed earlier, there were really three individuals who were invited to testify as experts. Two of them were uh, lead, uh, academic specializing in law, um, and one was an observer who had worked for the parliamentary monitoring group. Um, I should say there are many observers who work for the parliamentary monitoring group, and again, it was not entirely clear why that particular observer was chosen. So a very small number of individuals, um, two of whom made important contributions to um, the constitution and thinking about the structure and role of parliament in the 1990s, but it's not so clear that that expertise has continued uh, up until the present day in the sense of understanding how, how parliament has is, is evolved, both in terms of its own rules and in terms of its practices. Um, so that's the second. Uh, that's the second concern. Um, the third is the in both the uh, the evidence that was heard and then in the and uh, the subsequent analysis um, that there has arguably been a neglect of relevant evidence that contradicts the thrust of the sub inquiry. So in the paper, I elaborate on two particular examples. Um, the one was uh, South African Airways and the oversight of South African Airways, in particular by the Finance Committee after it was moved from the Public Enterprises Committee. And then the um, uh, controversial and important issue of the so-called nuclear deal. Um, and to, to give you a sense of essentially uh, why I focus on these two examples, it's because I suggest that in these two instances, in fact, two committees led by um, uh, members of the majority party, the African National Congress, actually did push back against uh, some of these dynamics of state capture. So while that is recognized um, to some degree in passing in the commission's report and in, the, and in a subsequent um, commentary by the parliamentary monitoring group, it's recognized in relation to the public enterprises committee, which was quite a high profile example. These lower profile examples, um, in the sense that they weren't really mentioned in the media, these, low, these lower profile examples are, are not considered. And if we come back to this question as to what the appropriate approach might be to this kind of inquiry, um, th that's quite important because it's about the balance of evidence. So if one wants to conclude, as, as, the, committee, as the inquiry seems to have done, um, that uh, having opposition chairpersons might lead to a better or would lead to a better result in terms of oversight and in terms of dealing with um, these kinds of corrupt activities, uh, neglecting evidence of majority party MPs um, pushing back as chairpersons of these committees is a problem. See? But this, this, in some sense, this is more of a social science issue, right, rather than, um, rather than a, a legal question. Um, it, again, it's not clear how one would use principles of law to determine uh, the, the weight of evidence in favor of having opposition party 
uh, chairs of committees versus um, majority party chairs of committees. But the paper elaborates on these two examples um, in some in some detail, and I suggest that the that the evidence adds to evidence, for example, from the Public Enterprises Committee and elsewhere to suggest that actually there was a pushback um, from, from the Parliament. I also, um, because, because of uh, some, some more recent events, I also note that the, the, the contrary is also true, that one can have opposition um, chairpersons of committees, but that doesn't necessarily need, lead to better outcomes. Um, We've seen in some instances where uh, chairpersons of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, who by tradition are um, members of, of opposition parties, have, um, have produced more robust oversight. But I mentioned two examples in the paper where, in fact, um, the opposite was the case. I, I suggest that in one instance, uh, it appeared as if the opposition chairperson was somewhat co-opted um, by, by a faction within the ANC. Um, and in the other instance, uh, they were put under pressure by external interests to back down um, on, on a robust approach to um, oversight of ESCOM. This is, this is in the post-state capture era. So these, these, kinds of, um, these kinds of considerations and the sort of evidence doesn't really support uh, the, the thrust or the conclusions of, of the inquiry in this respect. Um, a fourth concern is, is about exceeding the mandate of, of the broader state capture inquiry. If one goes back and looks at the original terms of reference, they were quite narrow, um, and there, but there was scope to broaden them. For myself, I was initially optimistic and broadly in favor of an expansion of the inquiry to consider what had happened to Parliament, if nothing else, in order to ensure that that was ventilated. There was a lot in, in, in my um, observation that did not make it into the media, that did not make it into the public domain, that was important. Um, and so in that sense, in that sense, I supported uh, the initiative, but the question was always going to be, how does that fit in to, to the mandate of the inquiry? And I think when it comes to issues like recommending consideration of changes in the electoral system, that really seems very far outside the bounds of the inquiry. And that takes me on to the, the fifth criticism, which is that's but even more so, even more greatly compounded, leaving aside who is selected as experts, the appropriateness of having senior counsel to lead the inquiry and so forth. But it's, it's compounded to an even greater degree by the exclusion of broader and public input into the consideration of Parliament's functioning. Now, one might argue that uh, that is not something that's within the remit of the Commission. Uh, I suspect um, that if uh, Concern like that were put to Judge Sondor, he would say, well, this is just a recommendation that Parliament should consider such an amendment, should consider changing the electoral system, but ultimately Parliament would have to um, uh, consider such legislation and and then would have to request uh, public input. So but, so the Commission hasn't ruled out that that would, is something that would still have to take place uh, according to the Constitution before any such change were made. Nevertheless, the point is that the Commission did decide to wade into this area, into this question of essentially um, the structure of South Africa's constitutional democracy to the extent that it pertained to Parliament. Um, and having made that decision to wade into this area, it arguably should have done more to, to solicit broader input, whether expert or otherwise, um, both on what actually happened within Parliament, but also on, 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 on different views as to how that how any, any problems or issues might be remedied. Because, of course, one of the reasons, for example, why the um, constituency-based system wasn't adopted was because they were considered to be downsides. Um, in this particular uh, presentation, I don't want to take it, and in the paper, I don't take a position on the merits of that system. There clearly are, um, there clearly, clearly are advantages to it, but there are also disadvantages, and there are also disadvantages to changing from one system to another. So having waded into this area, I suggest that the Commission if it wanted to address these issues, should have done more to solicit uh, to solicit broader and public input. And it is concerning that a number of civil society organizations have endorsed the recommendations of the Commission, despite the fact that they're drawn from a very limited group of individuals who didn't necessarily have very good knowledge of what had actually been happening in part. Um, and uh, led, led, by, uh, uh, led, led by a uh, lawyer who wasn't necessarily uh, by virtue of professions best equipped. Um, to do this, failed to consider relevant evidence um, and made some arguably quite uh, wide-ranging recommendations. Um, so it's concerning that some civil society organizations have endorsed these recommendations in that context when I believe they would never endorse 
uh, such recommendations um, that had emerged from a similar process elsewhere, precisely because of the exclusion of public participation, broader input, and greater attention to the actual evidence. So my concern is, and, and essentially the argument uh, of the paper, is that uh, when it comes to the sub-inquiry, and I don't deal with, with, with the broader um, say capture inquiry, when it comes to the subsequent, uh, when it comes to the sub-inquiry, the consequence is some uh, materially misplaced conclusions and recommendations, um, and the limitations of the overall process arguably undermine the legitimacy of the Parliament sub-inquiry. So that is the thrust of the paper and this presentation. Thank you very, very much for listening, and I hope um, that if the technology uh, works out, I'll be able to um, hear any comments and questions. Thank you so much for your time. So um, that was uh, our last presentation, and um, I think uh, he, the, the presenter really uh, gave a clear um, explanation of uh, his recommendations. Uh, I really wouldn't go further into the merit of, of them. And um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the two presenters who, have, who are present in the room, and um, I think if there are no other comments, we can close the session. Thank you. Sorry, uh, there is a, um, it's, it's, he's sent by Dr. Kambule. Do we have Dr. Ruan Rutete in the room? No, it looks like this. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, we're done for the day. You can go get ready for the gala dinner, and uh, we'll see you later. Thanks. Yeah.